Hello everyone and welcome to the complete Lost Episode Creepypasta Iceberg. Now this video is incredibly long, so I do apologize, but it was a blast to make. The amount of stories I had to go through to make this video was a bit astonishing though. A Lost Episode Creepypasta usually deals with a lost episode of a TV show or a missing scene in a movie. There's more variations than that, but that's the gist of it. Lost episodes are based on some things that do exist and others that don't. Most of the stories are based on some of our favorite childhood properties though. If you like iceberg videos, creepypastas, or general internet horror topics, please consider subbing to the channel. I post as often as I can, and I love to see the growing community. Now let's not make a long video any longer. Let's check out the iceberg. Red Mist is the story of an intern who used to work at Nickelodeon. They were brought on as an intern while working on their animation degree and were pretty happy to be able to work at Nickelodeon of all places. It would be a dream come true for most animation students. The intern then goes on to explain that they would get to view new episodes of TV shows before they were ready to be shown on TV. The intern was in luck and they were able to see an episode of Spongebob Squarepants before it was released. The team working on Spongebob were burnt out creatively after the movie, and so the next season was slow to release, but that wasn't the only reason. The intern notes this is a common practice in animation to name episodes differently as an inside joke for the team working on the projects. It was a way to let off steam and usually they were somehow related to the episode. The team thought that this name was a little morbid but they left it at that. They continue the episode and it starts with Squidward practicing his clarinet. He yells at Spongebob and Patrick who were being very loud just outside his window. The two leave and he continues, as he has to practice for his concert scheduled for that night. The screen cuts away to the end of Squidward's concert. The whole stadium is quiet. Then they begin to mercilessly boo him. Squidward has a terrified look about his face and body posture. The booing from the crowd was more sinister than normal, cartoon booing. It seemed like they really hated the concert and Squidward as well. Even Spongebob was booing with the rest of the crowd. The weirdest part though, were the eyes of the crowd. They all seemed to have real looking eyes. They were a little more realistic than CGI, but still obviously not real. They had red pupils and were bloodshot. This scene lasts for a little longer before it transitions to Squidward sitting on the edge of his bed in complete silence. He looks very upset, which is understandable with how that last scene played out. He puts his hand over his eyes and begins to cry. The camera then starts to slowly zoom into Squidward's face. As it does, flashes of image pop up between frames, so fast that you have to stop and go frame by frame to see them. Which is exactly what the editor did. He stopped the footage and played it frame by frame to see what just flashed on screen. They found it. It was a gory photo of a dead child on the side of the road. The shadow of the person who took the photo could be seen cast along the side of the child. The screen then went back to Squidward who was crying louder now. There were red streaks running down his cheeks from his eyes. The sobbing continued with a low baritone laugh in the background. The laugh was so quiet, it was almost impossible to hear. Another single frame of another gory scene appeared on screen. This one was just as messed up as the last one. The editor quickly left the image and continued with the episode. Squidward was still crying, but it was silent this time. Squidward removed his hands from his eyes to reveal the same realistic eyes that the crowd had. He had red pupils and the eyes were bloodshot. He just stared at the screen the same red streaks going down his cheeks as before. After another gory image of a child was shown, the screen went back to Squidward. A soft low voice said, Do it. Squidward put a shotgun in his mouth and fired. The wall behind him was splattered. The team investigated the footage but couldn't find any obvious methods of tampering. Police were called in to examine the footage but no links have ever been made to real missing children or any murder investigations. The author starts by saying that they are a fan of the anime series Axis Powers Italia. They found the show and fell in love with it pretty quickly. The author's sister joined them in their love for the show and eventually bought their own bootleg copy of the show online. The author was content with watching the show online though, so it didn't bother watching the DVD at all. A week later, the author's sister said she wasn't interested in Italia anymore. 
This confused the author, but they didn't question it any further. After a while, the author got curious about the bootleg DVD that her sister had bought. She had found it while searching through the DVD cabinet. It was placed all the way in the back, which also confused her. The bootleg DVD had most of the episodes that the author was looking for, but they noticed something strange. There was another episode in between 23 and 24. The episode didn't have a name, it was just a box. There shouldn't be an episode here, but there was. There was also a screenshot of the episode. It had Italy staring upward with glazed eyes. There was sand in the background, but not much else. The author started the episode and it seemed off right from the start. The episode started with Italy sunbathing in his jacket and shorts, while Germany and Japan stood off to the side. Both nations looked upset. The quality of the episode looked a bit raw. It was pixelated and not very polished in some parts. It definitely looked like it was ripped from a website. It had an unfinished nature to the animation. Besides the low quality animation, the show also lacked any subtitles, which meant that the author wasn't able to tell what they were saying. The voices, though, sounded just like the actual actors from the show. Japan and Germany appeared to be talking about being hungry. They each would grab at their stomachs in pain from time to time. The plot of the episode appeared to be about them being stuck on this island without anything to eat. Japan and Germany seemed to be hatching a plan. It's hard to tell, again, because of the lack of subtitles. The two kept looking over at Italy while speaking in hushed voices. That night, while Italy slept, the other two nations snuck up to him and picked him up. They carried the sleeping Italy very quietly and slowly. The two walked over to the ocean and placed Italy in it face down. Japan then placed his hands on the back of his head and pressed down. Italy tried to fight back as the two drowned him, but to no avail. Eventually, the flailing of his arms stopped and dropped into the water. The two carried Italy back to shore and Japan took out his katana. He cut into Italy and they pulled out some of his organs to eat. They were clearly starving and had decided that cannibalism was the only way to survive. The scene continued with the pair cooking the organs over the fire. They had decided that since Italy was the weakest of the three, he would be the sacrifice. Max and Ruby is a children's show that started on Nick Jr. in the early 2000s. It was a very popular show that starred two bunny siblings, Max, a three-year-old who was always up to something, and his overbearing sister, Ruby. In Max and Ruby 0004, the author is trying to get a hold of a DVD for his little cousin. Christmas was coming up, and Max and Ruby was their favorite show. It would be an easy gift to get, or so they thought. Searching through eBay and similar sites, the author just couldn't find any Max and Ruby DVDs. They seemed to have all been bought out, right before Christmas, too. The author didn't give up the search, though, and kept at it. One day, while the author was scrolling for the DVD, he heard something get pushed through the letterbox of his front door. He ran to see what it was, before the dog got a hold of it, and was surprised to see what looked like a DVD. Picking up the box and on the cover was written Max and Ruby, but it looked like someone had just written on the cover with black marker. Also on the cover was a drawing of two bunnies, most likely Max and Ruby, except they were just black outlines with eyes. This put the author off, but didn't deter him from taking the DVD inside and throwing it inside of his laptop. To his surprise, the episodes seemed to be in perfect quality, not like they were ripped from some shady website. They even had a menu with the episodes listed. The weird part, though, was that the episode were labeled as simply Max and Ruby 1, with this format continuing all the way to 4. The episodes seemed normal enough, at least the ones he watched. They were of fine quality and actually worked. The author decided to change out the box art, as it looked a little too creepy. He found a replacement online and printed it off. It was easy enough to replace and now it was ready to be a Christmas present. Christmas came and the author's little cousin loved the gift, seeming super excited to watch it. That would have to wait though, as they had other gifts to open still. The author's parents were going out for lunch and wanted the author to watch his cousin. He agreed as he had things he wanted to do anyway, and off they went. The author figured this would be the perfect time for his cousin to watch her new gift. The author turned on the DVD for her and left the room. While eating in the kitchen, the author heard a blood-curdling scream from the room his cousin was in. Fearing the worst, he raced towards the room. Inside the room, his cousin was laying on the floor crying. The author looked over at the screen and saw what looked like Max and Ruby on the screen against a black background. The freakiest part is that they appeared to have no faces, just empty eye sockets. The Max and Ruby theme song was playing in reverse as well. 20 seconds later and the TV turned itself off. The author tried to calm down his cousin by telling her it was a bad dream. This seemed to work and they laid down to take a nap. He then received a call from his parents. They said they wouldn't be home until late that night. 
He was secretly relieved though, as this would give him some time to examine the DVD in private. Plugging in his earbuds, he started the DVD up on his laptop. The episode started with Max and Ruby's parents looking incredibly upset about something. The dad spoke up, saying, such a shame, before they both started to choke. The screen switched to Max and Ruby standing in front of a gravestone that read, R.I.P. Mommy and Daddy. This lasted for a few minutes before it faded to black. The screen faded back in with Max and Ruby sitting in Ruby's room. They were both crying intensely. The scene went on for a while before switching to Max sitting alone in his room. Max was staring at a rope that hung over a chair in his room. Max got up slowly and walked over to the chair. He seemed to study it for a second before climbing onto the chair. He stared down as he placed the noose around his neck. A loud static played in the background as the screen faded to black. When it came back, Ruby was walking in on her brother. She started to scream just as the sound of the chair scraping against the floor could be heard. A few gurgling noises and the sound of tightening rope could also be heard. And then, nothing. Ruby started crying again, louder this time. She covered her face, but that did nothing to stop the sounds of her sobbing. The faint sound of static had grown incredibly loud, and louder still, until it finally got louder than Ruby's crying. The screen faded to black again before fading in with Ruby now standing in front of two gravestones. The one that had been mentioned before, and now a new one. This one said, R.I.P. Brother. The screen then faded to the two bunnies, like it had when the author had walked in. But this time, words were written above the picture. They read, Death is our only release. The author destroyed the DVD soon after, not wanting anyone to have to see what he did. The next couple of days went by as normal. He even forgot about the DVD for the most part. That is, until he heard something slide through the letterbox of his front door. It was a letter with his name on it. Opening it, he saw the words, Death is our only release. So do any of you remember those Mickey Mouse cartoons from the 1930s? The ones that were put on a DVD a few years ago. Well, I hear there's one that was unreleased to even the most avid classic Disney fans. According to sources, it's nothing special. It's just a continuous loop of Mickey walking past six buildings that goes on for two or three minutes before fading out. I let the cutesy tunes put in though, the song on this cartoon was not a song at all. Just a constant banging on a piano for a minute and a half before going to white noise for the remainder of the film. It wasn't the jolly old Mickey we've come to love either. Mickey wasn't dancing, not even smiling, just kind of walking as if you or I were walking, with a normal facial expression. But for some reason, his head tilted side to side as he kept his dismal look. Up until a year or two ago, everyone believed that after it cut to black, that was it. When Leonard Moulton was reviewing the cartoon to be put in the complete series, he decided it was too junk to be on the DVD, but wanted to have a digital copy due to the fact that it was a creation of Walt. When he had a digitized version up on his computer to look at the file, he noticed something. The cartoon was actually 9 minutes and 4 seconds long. This is what my sources emailed to me in full. After it was cut to black, it stayed like that until the 6th minute, before going back into Mickey walking. The sound was different this time. It was a murmur. It wasn't a language, but more like a gurgled cry, as the noise got more indistinguishable and loud over the next minute. The picture began to get weird. The sidewalk started to go in directions that seemed impossible based on the physics of Mickey walking. And the dismal face of the mouse was slowly curling into a smirk. In the seventh minute, the murmur turned into a blood-curdling scream and the picture was getting more obscure. Colors were happening that shouldn't have been possible at the time. Mickey's face began to fall apart. His eyes rolled to the bottom of his chin like two marbles in a fishbowl. And his curled smile was pointed upward on the left side of his face. The buildings became rubble floating in midair and the sidewalk was still impossibly navigating in warped directions. Mr. Moulton got disturbed and left the room, sending an employee in to finish the video and take notes of everything happening up until the last second. This distorted screaming lasted until 8 minutes and a few seconds in, and then it abruptly cuts to the Mickey Mouse face that appears at the end of every cartoon. In the background was what sounded like a broken music box. This happened for about 30 seconds, and whatever was in the remaining 30 seconds, I haven't been able to get a sliver of information about. A security guard was making his rounds outside of the room, and was told that the last frame, the employee stumbled out of the room with pale skin, saying, Real suffering is not known seven times, before speedily taking the guard's pistol 
and offing himself on the spot. The thing I could get out of Leonard Moulton was that the last frame was a piece of Russian text that roughly said, the sights of hell bring its viewers back in. As far as I know, no one else has seen it, but there have been a dozen attempts to get a file on Rapid Share by employees inside the studios, all of whom have been promptly terminated from their jobs. Whether it got online or not is up for debate, but if rumors serve me right, it's online somewhere under the name suicidemouse.avi. If you ever find a copy of the film, I want you to never view it, and to contact me by phone immediately, regardless of the time. When a Disney death is covered up as well as this, it means this has to be something huge. I've yet to find a copy of this, but it is out there somewhere. I know it. The 90s was a weird time for board games. Games like Nightmare with VHS that you could play along with the board game that you were playing. This created a weird multimedia game that overall didn't work super well. Nightmare wasn't the only game to try this though, as the author notes. There was another game called Rap Rat, a game he remembers playing as a child, even if it was briefly. The author's mom brought out a copy of Nightmare, but the author was a bit of a scaredy cat as he puts it, and she walked away. She returned with a different game in hand, this one looked a little more child friendly and was titled Rap Rat. The author's mom popped the tape into the VHS. Rap Rat then came on screen and the three of them sitting there were immediately met with something they didn't expect. Rap Rat looked terrifying, so much so the author's little brother ran from the room screaming. The author begged for them to turn off the movie. Rap Rat then screamed, wait your turn, in a deep voice. This only set the author off even more and he started to plead with his mom. She finally did as he asked and he sighed with relief. The author had vivid nightmares after this. It lasted for weeks until he just forgot about the game entirely. Repressing it as best as he could. It was all he could do, really. The author assumed that this would be the last time he ever saw the thing. That was until, while moving his old stuff from his mom's place, he found the rap rat tape. It was in perfect condition but covered in a thick layer of dust and spiderwebs. The author's girlfriend, who was moving to a new place with him, asked him what he had found. He was breathing harshly but finally uttered out the words, Rap Rat. She gave him a strange look, clearly not understanding. Even after he explained everything to her, she didn't believe him. He decided he needed to show her. Show her the thing that had haunted his nightmares when he was a child. At their place, he put the tape into the VHS player. After a second of playing, images flashed on screen, this time showing a clown with a nose that burst into a bloody mess. Then came a man being forced to pick up white hot metal that left his hands severely burned. Rap Rat appeared on screen again and reached out a very real looking inhuman hand. A second later the sound of faint scratching could be heard at the front door. Then the scratching stopped and now they could hear the sound of something walking on wood. The author broke from this fear trance and stopped the VHS. He ejected the tape but it was extremely hot like it was a Bunsen burner that had been left on for hours. He grabbed oven mittens and threw the tape outside, stepping on it and crushing it with his boot. The author and his girlfriend had nightmares every night after that. They would hear the scratching at the door, followed by the sound of something walking on wooden floors, and the sound of something heavy being dragged along behind it. What is the perfect job for a child? How about a cartoon tester? That is the reality of the author of Gregory's Room. The story starts with the author explaining that they had a pretty normal childhood. They had friends, loving parents, and above all other things, grew up in the 90s. The supposed golden era of kids cartoons. The author then remarks about how they were able to get a job as a cartoon tester. And luckily for the author, he was able to be one of the first people, along with the other test audience kids, to watch a new cartoon. A staff member came in and explained to them, the new cartoon they would be watching was called Gregory's Room, and if they liked it, they would send their parents the first season. This excited all the kids, including the author. The staff member put the DVD into the player and walked away. The screen started with some static for some reason. It was just static for a second before the screen showed what looked like a CGI room. Oh, I didn't see you there. A voice broke through the silence. The camera slowly flipped around to a very poorly animated CGI man sitting in a chair. He looked like the animators hadn't even tried to make him look like a real person. Hello, I'm Gregory and this is my room, the man said. We're going to have so much fun together, he continued. We can look at the stars together. We can read a book together. The camera then turned towards the fire. 
It slowly started to zoom in. We can stare into the glorious flames of the fireplace together. That line freaked out the author. The silence amongst the kids turned to fear as he started to speak again. But no matter what we do, it will be just the two of us. No parents, no police, no one can hear you. The music started to distort. Embrace me. I need love. Gregory needs love. The movie ended and every kid in the room burst into tears. The staff member ran in, yelling about some guy, but it was hard to hear him over the crying. The narrator grabbed the CD in the confusion and made their way out of the room with everyone else. Rumors about Nickelodeon being sued over damages started up. The author's parents decided to never let them go near Nick HQ ever again. The author remembers the dreadful creation, but holds onto the CD, hoping to learn of the reason for its creation someday. Seinfeld is a comedy series that ran for nine seasons, starting in 1989 and finishing its run in 1998. The show was pretty well loved by most all who viewed it. The author of this story claims that there was a missing or lost episode. It was episode 7 of season 6. They claimed to work behind the scenes at NBC and that's how they were able to get into the room where they kept all of the old episodes. The oddly titled The Mason was the missing episode that never aired. It was found along with old news film footage for some reason. The author dusted off the old tape and popped it into his VHS player in the room. The episode started off with a very loopy looking Jerry walking into his apartment. He remarks that all of his friends and family have been dying lately, a very strange thing to say so casually. Before he has a chance to sit down, his buzzer rings. George runs into the apartment and explains that the planes have crashed into the Twin Towers. A phone call then breaks the silence and happens to be Kramer on the line. The sound of screaming and other loud noises pierces through the sounds of the room. Kramer explains that Elaine is dead, and that he doesn't have much longer. The two were in the towers and had no way out. Jerry seems to walk off set saying something about his agent, and then the footage cuts off to a live recording of the incident. Jerry then reveals a secret hidden compartment, a table covered in black cloth and candles with a Masonic symbol at the center of it all. The episode kind of goes off the rails at this part, and reveals that Jerry is a lizard person. Yes, that is correct, Jerry Seinfeld is a lizard person, who predicted 9-11 and the swine flu epidemic. The creepypasta ends with an ominous warning about a third tragedy that has yet to happen. The Simpsons has a weird way of counting their episodes sometimes. This is due to a lost episode from season 1, titled Dead Bart. The episode was written and directed by the show's creator, Matt Groening. The episode is very difficult to find. So much so that the author had actually received a link to the episode from a piece of paper given to him by one of the original animators of the show. The paper was handed to him after he'd asked about the lost episode. The author found the episode and started it up. The first thing he noticed was how low quality the animation was, almost like it was done in the original short style. Every character also seemed to be acting differently. Homer seemed angrier than usual. Marge seemed depressed. Lisa was anxious. And Bart... Well, Bart seemed to hate his parents. The episode's plot had the family taking a trip by plane. The family boarded the plane without issue, but as they were flying, Bart started to mess around inside the plane. Bart then broke a window and got sucked out of the plane. The next scene showed a close-up of Bart's mangled corpse on the ground. Following that scene was just the family sitting around the table all crying. This lasted for the entirety of the second act of the episode. Act 3 had the family going to visit Bart's grave. For some reason, when they got there, the body wasn't in the ground. It was instead placed in front of the grave. The family looked down at him and cried as the camera zoomed in on Bart's corpse. The views then zoomed out as the episode came to a close. The graveyard was filled with the gravestones of Simpsons guest stars. For those that had already passed away, their dates would be accurate. For those who were still alive, though, the dates for them were all on the same exact date. That date was never given. Doug was a pretty popular kids show in the 90s. It starred Doug, a kid who wanted nothing more than to be greater than who he was. The show dealt with some serious issues, but the main theme seemed to be focused around self-confidence. The show also focused heavily on anxiety. Doug was always anxious and had vivid daydreams about everyone laughing at him in any given situation. They got so bad that sometimes they would literally ruin his entire day. 
The fans of the show started to have dreams about the show and made him really want to watch it again. He just didn't know how he would do that, as the show was out of circulation. Then, to his surprise, it came back for one week in the fall of 2005. The author was excited and watched it every day that it was on. He remembered all of the episodes except one, an episode that was titled Doug's Real Life. The intro of the show wasn't how he remembered either. The usual line drawings were there, but none of the characters appeared on screen. After the lines, it showed Doug writing in his journal in a very dark room. The title of the episode then came up on screen. The actual episode opened with Doug eating breakfast while he gave a narration about there being a big test today, one that he had failed to study for. This was actually a pretty normal setup for a Doug episode, so the author thought it was normal. The next scene had Doug walking to school before another of his vivid daydreams began. In the daydream, his teacher was telling the class how Doug flunked the test. The class began to laugh at him as their heads twisted and distorted around him. When Doug got to school, the screen flashed and the animation changed. The colors were darker and many of the background objects had changed color entirely. The school was now full of kids that the author had never seen before. After Doug sat at his desk, the animation switched back to normal. The scene then changed to Doug walking home from school. Just as Doug reached home, his dog Porkchop ran up to him. The screen flashed again and Porkchop was now a hunk of rotting meat, and Doug's house had become decrepit. Doug walked into the empty house and began talking to no one. The house had no one in it besides Doug himself. After Doug sat down at the table, the screen flashed and once again his family was sitting there with him. The phone rang and Doug immediately thought it was his teacher calling to tell his mom about the test. Another daydream started to play in his mind, with his parents yelling at him. The screen flashed again to the empty house. Doug was pleading with his parents, but no one was there. Doug walked off to his bedroom. Inside the room was mostly empty except for a book and a pencil. Doug wrote in the book with the narration playing. I can't tell which one is real. Cupcakes is a bit of a special story. It's not really a lost episode creepypasta, more like a fan fiction that was so disturbing it would become infamous in the community in which it spawned. Cupcakes is a My Little Pony creepypasta. One day Rainbow Dash was flying around and enjoying the air and the sun when she remembered how she was supposed to meet up with a friend of hers, Pinkie Pie. She flew over to her place and greeted her with a smile. Pinkie Pie did the same. Rainbow Dash asked what they were going to be doing today. Pinky replied that they were making cupcakes. This confused Rainbow Dash as she wasn't good at baking and figured Pinkie Pie would know that. Pinkie Pie assured her it wouldn't be that big of a deal and they would have a lot of fun. First things first, Pinkie handed a cupcake over to Rainbow Dash. The first thing she said they had to do was eat a cupcake. Rainbow Dash did so and then fell unconscious. The rest of the creepypasta is pretty disturbing and gross. Pinkie Pie essentially turns her friend into a cupcake ingredient. It's mostly just gore porn and doesn't have much story to cover. The ending, though, has Pinkie Pie sewing a lifelike puppet out of Rainbow Dash's hide. Then she sets off to do the same to all of her other friends. The story has terrified the brony community for years and has become something of a cultural milestone for them as well. Every community has that one story that goes overboard and MLP has more than its fair share. A very strange episode of Ed, Ed, and Eddie played one early morning. The episode was shown at 5am Eastern Time and the children who accidentally saw it were traumatized. It wasn't supposed to play and instead was supposed to be a rerun of the first episode. The animation was choppy and looked as if it were playing on an old VHS player with the little line running up and down the screen. The world of the show seemed darker, almost like they were in a perpetual fog. The characters of the show were behaving oddly. Instead of their usual hijinks, everyone seemed angry. The episode started off with Eddie walking down the street with Ed. Ed had read around his irises and seemed more angry than he had ever been before on the show. Eddie followed behind him and was in tears. Kevin, the antagonist of the show, was then seen riding his bike towards the pair. He kept speeding up and the screen kept getting blurrier. Eventually, right as Kevin was about to hit them, the screen cut to black. The next scene had Double D laying in Eddie's bed. 
The whole scene was in claymation for some reason, which only made it creepier. He then woke up and began walking around the room. The only sound in this scene were his footsteps. Double D started to scream as he realized he had no way out of the room. He started to run in circles until the screen blurred into just the colors of the room and Double D's orange clothes. The screen then transitions to Jimmy and Sarah at the dentist. Jimmy says it hurts as Sarah tries to comfort him the best she can. A moment later, a dentist walks in. He's a new character. And you can't see his face because he is tall enough to be just out of frame. Sarah was then escorted out of the room and we finally got to see Jimmy. His headgear was mangled and the front was bent upward, stretching his lip very high. He had blood on his gums and a few teeth were missing. The most disturbing part, though, was that he was missing his arms and legs. The scene faded out to commercials. When the commercials ended, the show came back to a very hairy Rolf standing in a darkened shed fisting a cow on loot. This lasted for a while until the camera zoomed out and the scene started to blur. A cutaway takes us to Naz sitting on a couch. The camera quality now is perfect for some reason. Johnny is then seen under Naz's couch. He crawls out on all fours and had no eyes for some reason. He almost resembled a mole. Johnny went behind Naz and opened his mouth wide, unhinging his jaw. He started to swallow Naz's head whole. They stayed like this for a second as Naz's body was kicking and flailing. Finally, her body went limp and the camera started to zoom in on the scene. The final scene has Double D laying on Eddie's floor before the camera zooms out to Eddie's house. The camera remained on the house for the remainder of the episode. The next program started right on the spot. ALF was a sitcom that ran on NBC from 1986 to 1990. The show consisted of an alien that lived life with a middle-class American family. It was pretty popular at the time, but had a very off ending to the series. The author of this creepypasta found a DVD being sold by a homeless man while visiting Japan. He bought it for no other reason than a vague interest in what could be on it. The disc didn't look in great shape either. The DVD remained at the apartment of the author until his friend came over one day. His friend noticed the disc and asked him about it. The author explained that he didn't even know if it worked and lacked the technology to make it work. That's when the author's friend told him about a man he knew that was an expert in salvaging things like this. They agreed that they would take the DVD over to his house and see if they could find anything on it. The pair went over to his house and they handed him the disc. He agreed to salvage it for them, but it would take some time. The author and his friend agreed to go to a bar nearby and wait for the expert to do his job. A few hours passed, and the experts showed up at the bar they were at. He handed them the disc, but didn't want to stay long. They insisted, but he really didn't want to stick around. He had what looked like a pure fear in his eyes. The expert agreed to one drink, but as soon as he was done, he was gone, telling the two that they shouldn't even watch the DVD. It's not worth it. This only increased their interest in the DVD. They had to watch it now. When they got back to the author's apartment, they took the disc into his laptop. The only file on the disc was an AVI file, with a random numeric name. The author double clicked the file and it started in full screen. The video appeared to be the lost final episode of the show ALF. It follows the cliffhanger ending where ALF is captured and taken by the alien task force. The first scene came up with a view of a dirty, dimly lit corridor. By the way the floor and the wall tiles looked, it must have been a hospital. The floor and the walls looked dirty and damaged. Like the building had been a place of a massacre. A quiet groan of pain could be heard from somewhere behind one of the double doors. Digital distortion ripped away the image and brought it back with the camera moving down the corridor, with screaming and guttural roars in the background. The white noise and digital distortion popped up again and changed the scene to a picture of Alf laying on a surgical table. There were wires plugged into the top of his head and one side of his face was matted with blood. Alf turned his head to look directly at the camera. Please, I miss you. Those were the only words he was able to utter through a strained voice of tears. Alf then began to scream for several minutes straight. It was the most blood-curdling scream that the author had ever heard in his life. Random clips of the show would play as he was screaming. Then the intro of the show started to play as if it was another episode. The intro was pieced together with images and sounds of Alf screaming. The autopsy continued when the surgeon re-entered the room. 
Images of Alf's body on the table appeared and disappeared. Still being mixed with scenes from the show, like it was a normal episode of the show. The final scene of the lost episode had Alf's severed head hanging by cables and wires. His spine was hanging limply out of his neck, but it looked a little odd. Instead of the spinal cord that you'd expect, it looked more like the bone structure of an arm extending out of the bottom of his neck. A voice then spoke. It was the voice of Willie Tanner, the man who Alf lived with. Good morning, Alf. The severed Alf head then started to scream as the video faded out with a credit sequence rolling. In the fall of 1987, a local news station in Atlanta, Georgia was attempting to fill a scheduling gap in their Sunday morning lineup. They decided to let a young Reverend Marley Sachs take the available hour block to do a religiously themed show. The show was pretty simple. The Reverend would read a passage from the Bible and then try to relate them to modern day-to-day -day life. The show was actually kind of popular, receiving pretty good ratings in its first month. In December, viewers of the show started to complain about uncomfortable feelings. They were mainly from women. Actually, they were all from women. They described feelings of nausea, back pain, dizziness, and blurred vision. The callers all believed that it was the Reverend's show that was causing this. It was discovered in the following weeks that these feelings were happening at every 12 minute interval. The show wasn't canceled as they couldn't prove the programming was the cause for these issues. By February though, the ratings and viewership for the show had dropped significantly, and so the higher ups decided to pull the plug on the show. The Reverend wasn't upset, he just left the set after his final episode and was never seen or heard from again. The time slot was filled with infomercials and a story covering a strange rise in miscarriages going on in the area recently. This news story was baffling both the CDC and the locals. It was also airing on every news station, so they had no choice but to give it more coverage. A year and a half later, an intern, while looking for footage on a new religious piece, stumbled upon the old show. He found the tapes in an old box. He began to go through them for footage he could use. While searching for footage, he accidentally stopped the tape at the 36 minute and 1 second mark and saw something grotesque on screen. A severed human head was staring back at him. He checked the tape by rolling forward and backwards a few frames and found that the head was only on screen for a single frame. The intern took this to one of the film technicians and asked them about it. He was just as confused as the intern and they decided to look through the rest of the tapes. That's when they noticed that the head seemed to decay the longer they watched it. The two decided to take the tapes to the higher ups and ask them about it. The higher ups, fearing for the backlash from viewers, ordered the tapes to be destroyed. The two complied, though the intern wasn't quite done looking through them all yet. The intern, before destroying the tapes, made his own copies. Later, he tried to talk to the technician about the tapes, saying that if you splice them all together, the severed head appears to be saying something. The tech wasn't interested saying they just wanted to forget about the whole thing. A week later, the police responded to a 911 call made by an elderly woman in one of the Atlanta suburbs at dusk. When the police arrived, they found a woman dead in her chair, in front of the TV. She had been gutted and a trail of blood led to her husband, the intern, as he rocked back and forth with a rusty piece of metal in his hands. At his feet was the body of his unborn child. When taken in, the only thing he would say was, the light of God calls them. Happy Happy was a short-lived Nick Jr. show that followed the adventures of Happy Happy. Happy Happy was a clay apple on a stick who would help kids when they were in need and teach them valuable real-world lessons. Each episode of the show was short, about 10 minutes, and aired on Nick Jr. in 1999. The episodes were played in pairs, making a single showing 20 minutes, plus commercials. The show lasted for a month before it was swiftly removed from airing. There were no DVD copies created, but a few did exist. A man found a DVD while doing some cleaning. The episodes were labeled HA 1 through 10. This would mean that he had access to the first 10 episodes of the show. The show was exactly how I mentioned above. Happy Happy would walk around helping kids with issues that they had. The first episode had Happy Happy teaching kids life lessons at the beach. The second episode had Happy Happy getting hurt and the kids helped him instead by giving him bandages and fruits to eat. 
The show would rapidly devolve from happy helping kids to happy hurting those around him. He would eventually garner a death stare and his apple form would slowly start to decay. Happy Happy was a lost show that should stay lost. Cry Baby Lane was a missing movie from Nick Studios. The movie was shown once before never being shown on TV ever again. The author explains that the original movie was too graphic and deranged to ever be shown again and was most likely locked away in Nickelodeon Studios' vault. The author explains how he worked at Nick during the creation of Cry Baby Lane and how he is one of the few people who actually saw the product to the end. Or would have if they hadn't walked off the set at the very last moment. The show was led by a deranged person who was obsessed with showing children how truly messed up this world can be. A lot of his ideas were disgusting and vile, to the point that the author was surprised this person was working on a kid's show at all. Whenever the author walked into the writing room, the whole team would explain their ideas for the story before the director shot them all down. He would then come up with some crude or morbid scene, and everyone seemed to enjoy it, or at least agree that it should be in the movie. Everyone, that is, except for the author. They fought the whole time with the director to get the grotesque scenes removed from the movie. Sometimes it worked, but many times they would still go ahead with the director's ideas. It got so bad the author left, just as they were wrapping up production. He didn't want to see the final product, and never actually did. Whatever the director had done to the film likely was mostly removed in editing. The final movie was nothing like the film that the author had originally seen, and he hoped it would stay that way. Have you ever stumbled across those strange and creepy public access channels? The ones where the content looks super low budget and you're wondering how they were able to get on air at all. In April of 1989, a five-year-old was surfing through the channels on his TV, looking to see if he could watch Pokemon. Instead, what he found was Channel 21, a channel that looked like it was a public access channel aimed at entertaining children. The channel was called Kaladin Local 21. The shows on the channel were a little weird. Firstly, there was a show called Mr. Bear's Cellar, which was like Bear in the Big Blue House in a way. A man in a very cheap bear mascot costume would welcome a new visitor, always a kid, to his cellar. Mr. Bear would then play games, dance, and sing songs. The songs were hard to hear since he was singing with his mask on. The game Mr. Bear liked to play the most was Hide and Seek. Another show on the channel was called Soup and Spoon. It was even more low budget than Mr. Bear's Cellar. The show had a can of soup and a spoon hanging from strings and they would interact with each other. Eventually the spoon would start chasing the can of soup saying he wanted to eat him. One episode of Mr. Bear's Cellar had two kids in the cellar at once. One kid was saying how it was late and he and his sister had to leave. Mr. Bear yelled at the kid before the kid threatened to call the police. Mr. Bear then chased after the kid and the episode ended. Mr. Bear also had an episode where he invited kids to come visit him in his cellar saying how they played games, watched movies, and even went camping. Elliot, the author of the blog discussing Kaladin Local 21, had been one of the kids who actually wrote to him saying he wanted to visit his cellar. The author of the blog received a letter from Mr. Bear that read, Dear Elliot, thank you ever so much for your letter. I would love to have you in my cellar. We play games, watch movies, and go fire camping in the middle of the woods. Come to my house at... The police cut out this address. Caledon, Ontario, Canada. I look very forward to having fun with you. Love, Mr. Bear. As Elliot and his dad made their way to the house of Mr. Bear, they were greeted by police officers. The police talked to Elliot's dad while he just wondered about what happened to Mr. Bear. The full story wouldn't be told to Elliot until he was a little older, but this is what he was told. The channel was run by an unknown man from 1997 to 1999. The man who ran the channel was also Mr. Bear and the cameraman, and pretty much every other character on the channel, aside from the kids. His goal was to kidnap children and hold them in his cellar, for unknown purposes. It wasn't as simple as him just being a pervert either. The man had other reasons for kidnapping children, one that was never disclosed to Elliot. The day before Elliot had arrived, Mr. Bear had fled the house, and the kids were never found, well, alive. The charred remains of 16 children were found in the woods, but no trace of Mr. Bear was ever found. Candle Cove was a TV show that ran sometime in the early 70s. Not a whole lot is actually known about the show, 
That's why a collection of people were trying to remember it on a message board. The OP asked if anyone remembered a kids show from the 70s. It dealt with pirates, was on a local station, and would come on at 4 p.m. The show was called Candle Cove, and it was a low-budget show about pirate puppets and a human girl named Janice. She would go on adventures with her pirate friends and get in all sorts of mischief. The members on the message boards started to reminisce about some of the weirder aspects of the show, like the boat with the human face on it, or Pirate Percy, who was a puppet with a porcelain doll head. There was also the villain of the show, a marionette doll called the Skin Taker. He was a creepy looking doll with a jaw that moved back and forth. When Janice asked why his mouth moved like that, he replied to grind your skin. A poster then brings up a weird recurring nightmare that they had about the show. It seemed like an episode of the show, but every character in the show just stared into the camera and screamed. This would go on for the full 30 minutes, and Janice was crying the entire time. Another person replied saying that they also remembered that being an episode, and not a nightmare. They went back and forth about whether it was a dream or an actual episode that they had repressed. It was too much of a coincidence for them both to remember this episode in this close of detail. Only one more episode was posted on the forum. It read, I visited my mom today at the nursing home. I asked her about when I was little in the early 70s, when I was 8 or 9, and if she remembered a kid's show called Candle Cove. She said she was surprised I could remember that, and I asked why, and she said, Because I used to think it was the strangest thing that you said, I'm going to go watch Candle Cove now, Mom, and then you would turn the TV to static and just watch Dead Air for 30 minutes. You had a big imagination with your little pirate show. A Bug's Life is an animated movie created by Pixar. It stars an ant who wants to fight an oppressive group of grasshoppers that are extorting his ant colony for food. The author of this creepypasta states that they found a deleted, never before seen from the movie. The author found a VHS tape while walking back from swim practice. The tape had a Bug's Life deleted scenes written on it. The author took the tape home and decided he would give it a watch. The tape started with five minutes of static before loading into a new scene from the Bug's Life movie. It seemed more violent, more mature, and overall darker. The scene started with the antagonist grasshopper strangling the life out of the protagonist ant. It was more brutal than the original scene, something more akin to an adult animation. A bird then flew down and attacked the grasshopper. The bird stabbed him with her beak before picking him up and flying off. The scene then cuts to black. When the screen faded back in, the grasshopper was being dropped into the nest of the bird. Baby birds then started to rip him apart. The scene was grotesque as it showed his body being ripped limb by limb. The author waited for the film to end before ejecting it and putting it back in the case. He decided to sell it on eBay so someone else could experience this horror. The Grieving is an amazing world of gumball creepypasta. The author of the story is named Sarah and she recounts her encounter with the dark episode. At 4am, just as Adult Swim was changing back to Cartoon Network, she saw a promo for a special new episode of The Amazing World of Gumball. Sarah wasn't the biggest fan of the show, but her little brother really liked it. So she would watch it with him on occasion. She decided to watch this episode so she could possibly spoil it for her brother later. Just a normal showcase of sibling affection. The episode was titled The Grieving and it started with Gumball, a blue cat character, staring into the corner of a dimly lit empty classroom. His eyes were puffy and red. His lip was curled downward and any glint of emotion was missing from his eyes. The scene then shifted to Gumball's dad in a black suit. This was odd since the dad was usually shown as a slob. He sat on the couch of his living room and started crying uncontrollably. The crying felt genuine. And it was at this point Sarah noticed that the animation was different. The backgrounds of the show, which were real world pictures with the characters animated over them, looked different somehow. They looked more unnatural, and they didn't fit in with the animation. The animation itself looked like old flash animation with sloppy looking characters. Nicole, Gumball's mom, then walked to the front door. She was dressed in a black dress with a matching hat. 
These two were clearly in funeral clothes. She sat on the couch and started to try and comfort her husband. His crying kept getting louder and more painful until the scene faded out. The scene transitioned into the school once again. The two parents, looking distraught, sat in the principal's office. The principal was explaining to them that two of their children had went missing earlier that day. Darwin, Gumball's adopted brother and best friend, and Anais, his little sister, had both gone missing. The principal, through a shaky voice, explained that they were eventually found, but not alive. Anais had been found first, and her head was found in a box covered in her own blood. Something had been written on the box, but it wasn't disclosed during the episode. Darwin had been found a little while later, alongside the rest of Anais. The pair had been mutilated and left in an empty field. The episode showed the remains of Darwin up close. He looked more realistic than the usual style of the show. It was enough for Sarah to want to turn off the episode. Sarah got up and tried everything to shut off the TV, but it remained on. She called her brother and asked him to watch the same channel as her. He didn't see the grieving, though and instead saw an episode of Looney Tunes. Sarah gave up and went back to watching the episode. Gumball's parents were still talking to the principal when they asked the question, where's Gumball? The parents thought he was at the school and the principal said he'd gone home already. The police were called and they started to search the school. It didn't take long to find him. When they found him, he was hanging from the ceiling of the classroom that the episode started with him in. The episode then just cuts to credits. We all remember when we were young, and there were shows we weren't allowed to watch. For some reason, just knowing you weren't supposed to be watching it made you want to watch it more. This is the story of the author of Turn the Crank. They were obsessed with the idea of watching Adult Swim, simply for the reason that their mom wouldn't let them. A tiny flicker of rebellion, even at the young age of six. The author used to sneak around when their mom was asleep to watch Adult Swim. They were eventually caught, and this led to an even greater want to watch the channel. Eventually, his dad would come down to see him, and his dad didn't care what he watched. At just six, his dad would expose him to the likes of South Park and other adult-oriented shows. While the author's dad was home, he convinced his dad to watch a new show with him. The dad fell asleep pretty quickly during the show. This left the author with the freedom to watch whatever show he wanted. A new show was coming on as the screen faded to black following a commercial. The author slid up close to the TV and waited before a new logo appeared on screen. It wasn't the Adult Swim logo. Instead, it was a logo that looked similar to the National Geographic one, but with no color. It appeared to be a movie that was starting. This excited the author, who was so excited that they would be watching a forbidden movie. It was also something they could brag to their friends about at school. The movie started with translucent rain mixed with droplets of blood falling from the sky. The rain fell upon a woman with purple hair, though the rain seemed to be draining the color from her hair. The animation of the movie was very low budget looking overall. The music that played in the background was eerie piano music that seemed to just drone on. The sound effects also sounded very low budget to just go with the theme of the movie so far. The camera then shifted to the face of the girl and it was cartoony. She looked like she had a power outlet for a face, but as the camera zoomed out, it turned out that she was a power outlet. A power outlet with slim, stick-like legs and arms. The stick-like woman raised her arm and the camera zoomed up the arm before moving towards a glass window. The camera went through the window and on the other side was a very large man, kind of resembling Santa. The very large man sat in front of an old record player on a small table. He began to turn the crank on the record player and it played some awful tune that sounded like something that would play at a funeral. Turn the crank, the man yelled suddenly. The camera zoomed in on the crank of the music box. The man continued yelling, turn the crank. He continued to turn the crank until it looked like the record player was starting to crack until it finally came all the way apart. The screen then zoomed in on the man's face as it shattered into glass. The glass then transitioned into the rain from before. Only you could tell it was glass falling from the sky and not rain. A city was visible under the falling glass. Rays of crimson could be seen on the rooftops of some buildings. On the ground was the power outlet shaped girl from before. She laid in a pool of her own blood as the glass fell upon her. A voice let out a final sentence. The girl is fine, don't you fret. Thanks for watching my show, kids, but you're not out of hell yet. With that, the show ended and the author started crying loudly. 
loud enough to wake up his dad. The dad accidentally changed the channel, but changed it back immediately after realizing what he'd done. The author stared at the screen. It wasn't Adult Swim that they had been watching, but instead, it had been a movie channel. Only this movie channel appeared to be one that they weren't paying for, as the channel said, Programming not authorized. Please confirm that you are subscribed to the channel, or unplug your receiver to resolve the issue. If you continue to see this error, please contact our cable provider. We apologize for any inconvenience. The Willy Wonka beta tape creepypasta is actually just hard to read. It tells a supposed alternate copy of the original story that was made before the book. It was released exactly one year before the book, actually. The author was able to acquire a copy by mail. He'd sent a letter to someone who was close to the author of Willy Wonka and was sent a VHS in return. I'm not sure why they decided to send some random person a VHS copy of something that could ruin their reputation, but they did. The VHS had the true story of Willy Wonka written on it in black marker, a pretty common staple for lost episode creepypastas. I can make a list of how many stories did this exact same trope, but if I did, then I wouldn't have the video up until 2023. The Willy Wonka beta tape creepypasta is probably my least favorite creepypasta of all time. I can't tell if it was meant to actually scare people or if it was a troll pasta in disguise. It's just not very good though, because it tries too many things. It's not really worth retelling the story, as there really isn't one. All it does is demonize Wonka in weird ways and add generic creepypasta tropes. I would have liked them to explore a lot more subtle horrific moments from their source material. A pair of siblings along with their babysitter are sitting down to watch a VHS tape of Scooby-Doo. The cover on the VHS had a weird hand-drawn look to it, kind of like it was a bootleg episode. Scooby looked very weird and the ghost girl was kind of creepy looking. They played the episode and it was kind of off from normal episodes of Scooby-Doo. It had a distinct lack of jokes and it wasn't particularly scary or interesting. The ghost in the episode for some reason didn't look like the one on the cover. Near the end of the episode, just as they were about to unmask the ghost girl, the Scooby gang stopped. They stopped everything and stared at the screen. This lasted for a few minutes before the episode just ended. They were all shocked until the author's younger brother said that it was messed up that Shaggy had died. The author thought this was strange, since that wasn't what he'd just seen. He tells them that he saw everyone just staring at the screen. The babysitter got upset and thought they were both messing with her and just left, mad. The two watched the episode again and saw that nothing strange happened. When they caught the ghost girl, it just ended. No strange staring and no shaggy death scene. They haven't watched the episode since. The Black Friday incident refers to a Toy Story creepypasta centered around the production of the first movie. Disney had sent the team at Pixar lots of notes with the main theme being that they wanted more edge added to the movie. Apparently Disney wanted it to be a bit darker film than Pixar wanted to make. The Pixar team would work around the clock on revisions and would still get messages back from Disney with the want for more edge. The need for edge had changed Woody's character the most. He was rude to the other toys and angry all the time. Bo Peep was also more prevalent in the story, but her role was mainly to flirt with the male characters. Buzz Lightyear was instead Lunar Larry and was more like an old school superhero. The higher ups at Disney would be shown the progress of the movie each week and each week would send back notes to the creators. The notes were always the same. Edge. This movie needs more edge. It was draining on the crew who were already working overtime. Eventually the head of the writing team had an epiphany. He knew exactly what Disney was asking for. More edge, darker humor, more cynical, and more adult situations and humor. He had a plan for the movie. A week later, a crew headed to Disney to show them what they'd been working on. The film reel was 48 and a half minutes long. It had taken them hours to get even just this portion of the film done. The movie opened up with Andy and Woody having a Western style shootout which turned out to be all in Andy's mind. The film was completely normal for the first 20 minutes. After that, the film started to show the edge that was requested of the team. For example, Mr. Potato Head would remove one of his eyes and throw it under Bo Peep's dress for a look-see. Woody would yell at the other toys and get violent randomly, but he had some major anger issues. Woody was almost like a tyrant in Andy's bedroom. 
The scene where Woody accidentally pushes Buzz out of the window instead had Woody throw him out after a fake handshake between the two. The sound of Buzz hitting the ground was a stock sound, but it still sounded much more rough than the original. The rest of the toys started to riot against Woody, eventually leading to him being thrown from the same window as Buzz. He landed much more gracefully than Buzz. When he looked over, he saw that Buzz was split open and parts of his insides could be seen. Buzz's eyes were also bulging from their plastic slots. The reel then cuts to Woody and Buzz trapped inside of the claw machine at Pizza Planet. Instead of the aliens from the movie, they have little pizzas with sunglasses on surrounding them. Sid still finds them, but for some reason, he's smoking cigarettes as he attempts to win the toys from the machine. The scene plays through some bizarre footage before jump cutting to a naked Woody against a black background. He appears to be smiling as his flesh starts to rot away. He then dips his hand into his empty eye socket and writes on the wall behind him the word EDGE. The word EDGE was the last thing on the screen. The Disney employees had to leave the room, and they decided that they wouldn't interfere with Pixar anymore and let them make the movie they originally wanted to make. Dead Bart was a disturbing tale from the Simpsons universe that was uncovered by an employee who worked on the show. According to his sources, that wasn't the only unusual episode of a Matt Groening TV show to exist. There was, in fact, another. But this one centered around the show, Futurama. The stress from working on the two shows simultaneously got to Matt, and he announced that he would be writing an episode of Futurama 100% by himself. This didn't alarm the Futurama team, but the Simpsons team were a bit scared of what he might do. The same person who archived the Dead Bart episode also got their hands on this episode as well. The episode was titled Not Long Enough and took place within the first season of Futurama. The episode started with Fry, Leela, and Bender as they are on a delivery mission. It is never stated where exactly they are going or what they are delivering. The mood seems to be very tense as both Leela and Bender are mad at Fry about something. Fry isn't very smart it can do some pretty stupid things, but this seemed different than just being mad at something stupid he'd done. They seemed genuinely upset, almost like he'd done something unforgivable. The Planet Express crew finally lands on an unnamed planet. The planet seemed to only have one house in sight. They walked over to the front door, and a grotesque looking alien opened it. He took the box and opened it to reveal a knife. He took the knife out of the box and stabbed himself in the chest. As the grotesque alien bled out on the floor, Fry, Leela, and Bender just got back on the ship and left the planet. The next scene had the crew flying through space in near silence. There was no talking, but there was a dissonant piece of music playing. The Planet Express crew finally landed back in New York City, but it seemed deserted. There wasn't even a Planet Express building. Fry tried to apologize to his friends, but they both gave him the cold shoulder. Fry walked away and walked through the empty streets of New York City. Eventually, he reached the cryogenics building where he had been frozen at the start of the show, and began to cry. Through tears, he entered the building. Fry went over to one of the tubes and set the timer to a massive number before climbing in. The screen then faded to black for a moment before returning to a view of Fry. The machine hadn't worked correctly, and parts of him started to decay and bone could be seen. Fry wasn't dead, though, so he climbed out of the machine and into an indescribable place. It seemed to go on forever as he walked through the place of crazy colors and shapes. The camera zoomed out until we saw that the place was just a speck in the pupil of Fry's eye. Fry had fallen out of the machine and was just lying on the floor of the abandoned room. His body looked like it was drawn in a far more realistic style than the show was normally. The camera stayed on him for an uncomfortable amount of time. Leela and Bender walked in. Leela said he got what he deserved before setting out on their next delivery. She placed a knife in a cardboard box and set out for the ship. Faith Buddies is one of those late night television shows with a religious message. Some of the shows like Junior Christian Science Bible Lesson, it had puppets interacting with children. It was like a very low budget Sesame Street with Bible lessons. The show though, felt a little off. It wasn't like other puppet Christian shows. It had its own unique tone that set it apart from others, almost like the showrunners were a little deranged. 
The Bible stories of the series would show were much more graphic. They were all told using a slideshow of colored pencil sketches along with some narration. The depictions were much more graphic than a show of this nature would be. They displayed graphic imagery in several stories, including the murder of Abel by Cain, people drowning in Noah's Ark, the plagues of Egypt, and the trials of Job. There were also numerous appearances of Satan and far darker imagery than expected of a kid's show. The main cast of characters for the show included three puppets. Pinky, who was basically the main puppet in the show. He was in every episode and was usually the character that drove the story and told the lessons. Each episode also ended with the camera zooming in on his face. The other two puppets, Bertie and Greta, were just there to act as an opposite to Pinky. Pinky was the knowledgeable character, who the other characters would come to with questions. Pinky would then answer their questions with a very demeaning tone. He would usually lecture the other characters until they changed their opinion. Pinky had this holier-than-thou vibe personality. He would always have an answer to any question, usually rating them back to a Bible lesson. For a few times he would receive a question where he didn't have an answer, he would say things like, be careful to question like that, or don't question God's ways. The show was obviously the deranged religious ramblings of an insane person. They wouldn't shy away from any controversial topics either. When discussing these topics, they had no tact or subtlety. This included Pinky belittling a child for asking a question, leaving the girl on the verge of tears. Each episode of the show opened with Pinky asking a question. Usually it would be something like, how do you feel about forgiveness? Then a black title card would show up with white text showing the episode title. In this example, it would be forgiveness. The final episode of Faith Buddies was called Predestination. It opened up with Greta and some kids asking Pinky what predestination was. Pinky then explained that some people are destined for heaven and others are destined for hell. A kid then asked how they would know which one they are. Pinky said that if you look deep inside your heart, then you might just find the answer to that. Pinky then stares at the screen and everything seems to come to a halt. A title card comes up and says, There is no redemption for the damned. Another slideshow starts with a man and a woman hugging while being burned alive. People with their feet chained to the ground are being eaten by devils with long mouths. People in a lake of fire with their flesh being burned and then healing to do it all over again. The credit scene plays with a few of the set of the show. This included showing lights, cameras, and microphones. A man in a black hood walks on set and douses everything in gasoline before setting it all ablaze. The final scene has the man in the black hood, along with what looks to be the cameraman, throwing the puppets into the fire. The camera zooms in on the burning face of Pinky on the fire. The 13 Tom and Jerry shorts made by director Gene Deitch are famous for their poor quality and rather disturbing nature, featuring badly done sound effects and animation and having a more realistic feel to the violence. Some have speculated that Deitch didn't like the concept behind Tom and Jerry and was pressured into making them, and wanted to make the people who watched his take on it feel bad for liking the concept. What many people don't know is that Deitch was originally signed on to make more than the 13 episodes that the public had access to. Desperate to get out of his contract, this final short would be much darker than anything Tom and Jerry had done before. It opened with Tom in a typical Tom and Jerry house. His owner was the fat, angry guy from the other Deitch shorts. Tom's owner seemed even angrier than in his other appearances. The first scene is him stomping on Tom's tail in a very realistic and painful looking way because Tom is sleeping by the basement door. The owner yells at Tom to never go down there. Tom is clearly terrified and runs away to another room. A view stays in the room by the basement door, and we see Jerry come out of his mouse hole. He looks truly grotesque, far more off-model than the other Dyke shorts. He gets an evil look on his face and follows Tom into the next room. The next few minutes are fairly formulaic. Jerry repeatedly manages to trick Tom into chasing him to the basement door a few times, but each time the owner catches Tom, he inflicts a painful looking injury on him which stays with Tom even after the scene ends. After three beatings, Tom is bruised all over, bleeding in a few places and limping on a broken leg. After this, Tom starts to literally beg Jerry not to bother him anymore. He's not really talking, but he's crying and mumbling 
and you can tell what he's doing by his body language. Jerry just laughs at him and pushes him back to the basement door. The owner catches Tom again and goes ballistic. The camera zooms on his face. It changes color and distorts as he yells at Tom in a much louder voice than any other sound in the cartoon. It seems like Jerry has finally decided to take pity on Tom though. Jerry picks up a knife that was lying around and stabs the owner in the leg, quite graphically. Tom opens the basement door and they carry the owner's body down the stairs. There are dozens of other bodies down there, decaying and showing signs of their violent deaths. Tom and Jerry shake hands and it seems like they've triumphed over the serial killer. But Jerry gets an evil look on his face again and Tom says in that ghostly deep voice, don't you believe it. Jerry then stabs Tom, killing him and throws his body in the pile. The last shot is Jerry putting up a for sale sign on the yard of the house, laughing, clearly planning to do it all again. Scooby-Doo Lost Episode God is a troll pasta about Ultra Instinct Shaggy. It's pretty funny to see this meme become a creepy pasta, but it's not really anything worth noting. Just Ultra Instinct Shaggy calling himself a god and killing his friends. The creepypasta wasn't supposed to be taken seriously, and I'm not going to. It's just a funny story that uses all the usual tropes of the Lost Episode genre. Finding a Lost Episode of a children's show, in this case Scooby-Doo, then having one character being different and evil now. The story is pretty funny and I would recommend anyone who wants a laugh to give it a go. It probably would have been funnier when the meme was still relevant, but yeah, not much more to say. Oh yeah, and the story ends with the narrator being killed by Shaggy who teleports out of the TV. In 2004, a group of three men had performed an urban exploration inside of an abandoned house in Wyoming. The men started exploring and venturing further into the building and ended up finding a cassette in an old weathered box. The cassette was labeled as Mouse Funny, written rather sloppily in black marker. The men, as soon as they got home, put the tape into an old VCR. It appeared to be a blurred out Mickey Mouse cartoon. Not the type from 2004 or any of the modern cartoons that would have been broadcast regularly. The image eventually cleared up and the title Mouse appeared on the screen. It then faded out into a less blurred image of Mickey, a single looping frame of Mickey just standing and staring blankly at the screen. Mickey had detailed white eyes, pencil shading and lighting that had clearly applied to the eyes and greater detail scales were present. Mickey stared at the screen as it zoomed into his face very slowly, almost too slow for the viewers to tell it was zooming at all. As the camera zoomed in, he began to smile and his eyes began to widen. The sound of a metal bell ringing began to loop every six seconds as Mickey continued to stare. Mickey's eyes began to bulge and separated from each other as his mouth curled to his ears. The image of Mickey started to blur and what almost sounded like a faint screaming began to play in the background. The sound of metal scraping against a hard metallic floor, the screaming and the metallic sounds continued as Mickey's face began to twitch rapidly. His smile stayed. His face overtook the screen as the screaming became one man screaming on a loop. Then Mickey ran off screen. There was a darkness and silence. Nothing. The tape ejected itself. About a year later, the man who had reportedly collected and analyzed the tape the three men had discovered was found dead inside of a trash can outside the same house. Two of the three men who had found the tape had refused to talk about it and would block all communication. They seemed to be fidgety and paranoid. The last man, who hadn't been identified, had gone missing. After some time had passed, the tape had been procured by another man, who said the tape was an obvious bootleg. He wasn't sure who had made it, but it definitely wasn't anything Disney had done. The originator of the tape remains a mystery to this day. The author of this story finds a strange episode of Scooby-Doo on Netflix. 
The episode in question was newer, from a series that aired in the early 2000s. He didn't recognize it because he'd only ever seen the original Scooby-Doo episodes, but put it on for his kids. The episode starts with the gang winning a trip to the Scooby Snack Factory. The way in which they won the trip was through Shaggy finding a single box sized Scooby Snack in his box of snacks. The gang then tweeted about it and were invited to the factory, after that tweet went viral. The plot sounds silly enough for a kid's cartoon, but it was odd since the show shouldn't have been airing when tweeting was a thing. At least, not that the author was aware of. Either way, this episode seemed oddly familiar to another one he'd seen them watch a week prior. The gang then proceeds to the factory, and that's when the author realizes how boring this episode was. The characters didn't make any jokes, nor was there anyone with a pun for a name. It was just a very boring and formal tour of a factory. The author walked around the house doing chores and only catching glimpses of the show, until they walked in and saw a dead body on screen. Now, he was sure something was going on with this episode. Scooby-Doo had some dark episodes, but they'd never shown a dead body before. According to the author's kids, this was actually the second dead body to appear in the episode. The author decided to watch the rest of the episode without his kids. They left and went to their room to play. Fred was the dead body they'd found. It didn't make sense to kill a main character, especially not in a kid's cartoon. The episode continued with Shaggy and Scooby eating comically oversized sandwiches. Scooby said he wasn't hungry, so Shaggy gave him a weird purple Scooby snack. Eating it, his face and demeanor seemed to change instantly. Next scene was Daphne and Vilma walking around the factory. They eventually ran into Scooby, who had a giant bulbous stomach now. There's a pile of Scooby snacks next to him, with Shaggy's arm sticking out of it. Daphne grabbed the arm and when she tugged on it, the arm came out without the rest of Shaggy. They immediately blamed Scooby, who told them he didn't, before eating another purple Scooby snack and then attacking Daphne. Velma called in security, and they were able to wrestle Scooby away from the now bleeding out Daphne. Velma then reached behind Scooby's head and started to pull up the mask. The mask finally gave way and revealed the author's face. The author turned his head, and the head in the cartoon mimicked his movements. He was dumbstruck. How was any of this happening? Velma then reached behind his head again and started to pull. The author felt something clawing at the back of his neck before he shut the TV off. The feeling stopped, he took a moment to collect himself. Later the author was searching Reddit to see if anyone knew of the episode, and most couldn't identify it at all. He almost didn't believe it himself, but the scars on the back of his neck are proof enough that it exists and it's out there somewhere. While watching Samurai Jack late at night, the author sees a strange broadcast. It was on Adult Swim, so it could have been like some of their other odd late night programming, like This House Has People In It, or unedited footage of a bear. The only difference is the show seemed very low quality, unlike the other shows mentioned. The show had five people sitting on a couch, watching the camera as if it were a TV. It seemed so odd these people were just watching TV and having pretty mundane conversations. Eventually, each of the five people slowly left the room for whatever reason. When they were all gone, the only sound that could be heard was the TV, which sounded like it was playing Samurai Jack, which is what the author wished he was watching. After a few moments of nothing, a silhouette of a man seemed to fade in at the corner of the screen. His body was made of static and he was standing behind the couch and facing directly at the camera. A moment later, two girls walked on screen. One of them was yelling at the other, saying that you did it and I can't believe you killed him. Then, the one yelling picked up an axe and brought it down on the other girl's head. The other girl rushed in and pulled the weapon from the girl and pinned her to the ground. Then it just ended. The author wrote it off as an edgy short film and went to bed. The next day, the author searched his social media to see if anyone else was talking about the short film, but he couldn't find anything. No one else seemed to have watched it. Or at least the people he followed didn't. Even his friends had all gone to sleep before it would have aired, so that meant it was just him that had seen it. A week later, the author awoke to the sound of firefighters outside of his door. He walked over and asked them what they were doing. The firefighter explained that someone had hooked up their laptop to this pole and broadcast something out to the neighborhood. And they were there to remove the excess wires they'd left behind. The author left and went straight back to their house. He decided to skim through the newspaper and see if he could find the strange broadcast again, and found something interesting. 
he found an article about a murder that had recently happened. The case had many similarities to the broadcast he'd seen, including the amount of people in the house and the mention of someone else being murdered. Later, a friend contacted the authors saying they'd seen the broadcast and had actually recorded it. His friend, named Randall, wanted him to come over to his place and watch it. When he got there, Randy invited him in and told him to keep the lights off since he had a hangover. The author thought this was odd, but went inside anyway. They watched it together and confirmed it was what they had seen. The author then took the tape and started to make his own copy, but after trying to watch his copy, it didn't work. The tape would just stop at the part where it cut away from the Samurai Jack episode. The author decided to go back to Randy's house and give him back his tape, but found his door locked and his car gone. A moment later, he received a phone call from Randy. Randy explains to him how he should just stop looking into the broadcast. Randy then said, he spoke to me before hanging up. Ren and Stimpy is a gross out cartoon that aired on Nickelodeon. It was also the favorite show of the author of this story. He explains his home life is not great as his parents always fought. One Christmas, he received an episode compilation of Ren and Stimpy on DVD from his dad. The DVD featured some of the better episodes from the show and a brand new episode. The new episode was listed as a special feature on the case. The DVD menu was what you'd expect from a collection. It had Ren and Stimpy written everywhere and had taken screenshots from the show as the backgrounds. The author wasted no time in selecting the new episode and starting it. The thumbnail for the new episode had Ren looking scared while he's staring up at something. The episode started with Ren waking up and heading downstairs for breakfast. He appeared to be in a foul mood. Stimpy was preparing food and told Ren that he should make some coffee before eating. The pair sat down to eat and Ren devoured his food before getting up to leave. Stimpy asked why he didn't help him with the dishes. Ren yelled at Stimpy about how it was his turn to do the dishes. Stimpy looked upset at this, but continued doing the dishes anyway. After the dishes were done, Stimpy went to grab some money so he could go shopping. Ren caught him and yelled at him about how it's too early to go shopping and that he needed to prepare lunch at 12. The screen cut to Ren watching TV. He looked at his clock and saw that it was lunchtime. He called out to Stimpy to ask if he'd started lunch yet, but got no reply. He walked into the kitchen and saw that he wasn't there either. He kept calling out to him before making his way towards Stimpy's room. Ren found Stimpy curled up in the corner. He walked over to his friend and was about to yell at him again, but stopped. Stimpy turned around and he looked different. He looked like a demonic cat with real sharp teeth and sharp claws. He looked irate. Stimpy slowly walked towards Ren. Ren backed away, but not before Stimpy swiped at him and cut his cheek. The claw marks were deep and the blood flowed in a more realistic way than cartoons usually showed. Ren asked him why and Stimpy replied, you made me do this. For all the harassment, all the yelling, all the bullying, you're going to get what you deserve. Ren gets knocked out by Stimpy and wakes up tied to a chair in the kitchen. Stimpy then cuts him with a knife, exposing the inside of his stomach. Ren falls from the chair to the floor. The episode then ends with Stimpy throwing Ren into the grave and saying, Dirt like you belongs to the ground. Thomas and Friends was a show that began airing in 1984 and has been extremely popular with children. The author of this story used to work on the show and loved doing so, up until they switched from Thomas and Friends to Thomas and Friends Big World Adventures. The author states that they still worked on the show, but only on some special ones that focused on Edward and Henry. While searching for some files at work, the author noticed a file titled Thomas and the Unfinished Bridge, Restricted. This puzzled the author, who had never heard of this episode before. When he clicked on it, he found it was password protected. The author questioned their boss about the file and was told it was a cancelled episode that was set to air as the finale of the second season. When he pressed further, his boss said the episode contained stuff too graphic for children and that the creator was fired, which left the episode in its cancelled state. A tape was created, but it was stolen, possibly by the person who created the episode. The author states that he is a very curious person, and he couldn't sleep knowing a never-before-seen episode of the show that he worked on was out there somewhere. So they started an online search for anything related to the episode. After a bit of searching, 
he decided to check eBay and actually found someone selling a VHS tape with the same name. It took eight days for the tape to arrive, and when it did, the author went right to watching it. The episode started with Thomas on a passenger trip. The scene was pretty average, and the quality was normal for the second season, except there was no narration. The episode began to pick up speed when Thomas found his brakes weren't working, and he blew through a train station at full speed. The music was picking up, but still no narration to go along with it. The music that played was the kind that would typically play in these tense situations in the show. Thomas kept gaining speed and passed a sign that said Unfinished Bridge. The camera panned out to show how close Thomas was to the end of the tracks. Finally, the conductor was able to get the brakes working again and told Thomas to apply them. Thomas smiled and began to speed up. The next scene showed the passenger car full of people who were screaming. The screams continued as Thomas plunged over the side of the unfinished bridge and crashed on the rocks below. The video cut to static for 10 seconds before coming back to a man cutting the face off of Thomas's train. He threw Thomas's face onto a flatbed that was immediately picked up by a giant claw and thrown into an incinerator. The face melted with Thomas smiling. And that's the end of the creepypasta, but for some reason there's an aftermath section that ruins the entire story. The author writes that they then uploaded the video to YouTube, and it got 50,000 views and more than 100 comments, which is kind of a weird way to end your story. Firstly, the story wasn't amazing by any means, but this ruins all believability. The idea of finding a creepy prototype of an unaired episode at work is cliche, but still interesting. Saying you then uploaded it to YouTube and it went semi-viral, when you never did, is kind of lame. Without that ending, it's not that bad. With the ending, it's cringy at best. The Loud House is a very popular cartoon on Nickelodeon. It stars a boy named Lincoln as he has to manage a life where he is both the middle child and the only boy in the family. He has five older sisters and five younger sisters. Loud House Enough is Enough is about Lincoln going on a sadistic, murderous rampage and killing all of his siblings before killing himself. There's not much more to say than that, as each section of the story is just about how he kills each of his sisters. The first sister, Luann, the one that wants to be funny, ends up not actually being dead, ends up also killing herself for some reason. This last episode of Creepypasta just reads like a strange fan fiction, like cupcakes but without the extreme gore. The Creepypasta is being reworked on the website, so I guess I'll come back to it when the author is done rewriting it. For now, it's pretty generic, but kind of fun to read if you have nothing better to do. Stick Stickley may be one of the least creative characters ever made, but he still holds a very special place in the hearts of 90s children for his several years of hosting Nick in the afternoon. Most information on Stick Stickley says he hosted Nickelodeon's summer afternoon block from 1995 to 1998, but I always swore that I remember seeing him on TV earlier than that. I thought I was crazy for quite a while, but recently I found a small fan site for Stick Stickley that mentioned him hosting a 1993 afternoon block during the school year called Afternoon Snack with Stick Stickley. To my joy, the website even had videos of Stickley's segments. I watched one marked First Ever Stick Stickley Appearance. Stick Stickley was in front of a chalkboard with Afternoon Snack written on it in normal writing. His design was a little different. His eyes were smaller, he had no nose, and his mouth was a straight line instead of being curved into a smile. He made a couple of corny jokes, then said Rugrats was coming up next. The video ended at that point. I moved on to the second episode, which was called Stick Gets Injured. Stick Stickly had the same face from the first video, but his body seemed a little worn. There are a few splinters sticking out of his side. Stick Stickly then said, Well, the dog next door buried me, but I managed to get it. The show you all voted to see, Hey Dude is up next. And don't forget to send in your postcards to vote for the special guest you want to see. And remember, that address is... Redacted. He sang the classic song about writing to him, but the tune was different than in later versions, much slower. After he sang the song, he just stood motionless for a few minutes before the video ended. The third was called Hang Stick. Stick Stickly was hanging in the air by a piece of string tied around his waist. A little boy who looked about five was also there. 
and the chalkboard had six dashes on it, representing a six-letter hangman word. The kid was guessing letters, and each time he got one wrong, the string around Stick's waist would move higher. The game would be over when it reached Stick's neck. The kid kept guessing letters, and when the rope was one incorrect guess from Stick's neck, the letters filled in were C, N, D, L, and E. It was obvious what the word was, but the kid wasn't taking the game very seriously. Giggling, he guessed X. The rope moved to Stick's neck, and his eyes flashed out of existence and were replaced by two X's. There was no sound for about 30 seconds. The kid stared at Stick's body, then Stick's eyes flashed back to normal and he laughed. Said he was fine and that Wild and Crazy Kids was on next. The fifth video was marked Stick Gets Mad, No Sound. Like the description said, it was silent. Stick was moving very quickly, with body language indicating he was yelling. A little girl was cowering from him, clearly afraid. The girl eventually left and Stick just faced the screen. His animation was so simple that I couldn't tell if he was talking. The sixth video was called, The Winner Revealed. Stick had a dark red stain on the top of his head, and one of his eyes was an X. Stick made no mention of his appearance, and announced that the votes were in, it was time for the special guest show to air. His last bit of dialogue was, It's been a long contest and the vote was close, but you, the kids have decided. Coming right now, the classic you all voted for, Candle Cove. There's at least one creepypasta per section of this iceberg that's just entirely a cliche. The way they're written makes it sound like they were a genuine attempt at a story and not a troll pasta. Cold is a SpongeBob SquarePants Lost episode creepypasta in every way. The author finds a videotape at a yard sale containing only two episodes of SpongeBob, one that the author knew in a brand new episode he'd never seen before. The author takes the tape home and puts it in the VHS player. The episode is called Cold and has a noose hanging in the background. Of the title card. It wasn't even the episode that was advertised. The episode starts with Spongebob and Patrick talking outside. The two then get into an argument before both storming off. The weirdest part was that the two had exchanged profanities before doing so. Later, Patrick is sitting in a bathtub with cuts on his arms. He appears to be lifeless before his eyes go black and he emerges from the bathtub. He grabs a shotgun and runs over to Spongebob's house. Spongebob opens the door and sees Patrick aiming the gun at his face. The two exchange a few more profanities before Patrick shoots Spongebob. His body fell limply to the floor and Patrick began to laugh a very deep laugh. The episode ended with a few more gory scenes of Spongebob before transitioning to a hanging Sandy for the remainder of the runtime. Jigsaw BBC was a BBC television series that started in 1979. It was pretty popular and spawned a character that horrified many who viewed it. His name was Nosy Bonk, and he was made to entertain children. The creepypasta has a man who worked on the show talk about an unaired final episode that one of his co-workers worked on. The episode was strange, but it wasn't until after he'd snuck back into the viewing room to watch it by himself that he saw what it really was. The episode had Nosy Bonk sitting at a dinner table with a long knife resting on the table. The whole episode was in black and white for some reason. Nosy Bonk placed his head on the table before staring at the screen for a while. The episode then shifts to weird edits of Nosy Bonk from the regular show. They were edited together in a jarring way. Nosy Bonk would stare at the screen with low murmuring playing in the background. Eventually the murmuring turned to screams. The author left the studio after the episode ended and threw the tape in the trash on his way out. AFE Lost episode is about a man who receives a strange email from a friend. The email came from a friend who had a passion for finding weird and disturbing things. So they expected the email to contain something of that sort. Their email had a video attached, which appeared to be an episode of America's Funniest Home Videos. The author's friend said that they found an episode of America's Funniest Home Videos playing on a strange channel that seemed to work randomly. They recorded some of the episode on their cell phone and sent it in the email. The episode appeared to take place on Christmas as the host was wearing a Santa costume. The show seemed a little off as there was no live audience. The host seemed pretty normal during the beginning of the show. 
As the actual clip started playing though, everything seemed wrong. The first clip was of a Christmas tree catching fire. The second clip had a nail gun accidentally firing off and hitting someone in the head. Another clip had someone falling off the roof of a house while putting up Christmas lights. The theme of the episode seemed to be showing clips from submissions that seemed to be too graphic for normal viewing. But even so, these were way too graphic. The show ended without the usual fan voting. The host said goodnight, and then it ended. The author's friend searched the channel again and found that it had other similar American TV shows. If she clicked info on the show that was playing, it would immediately stop working. A serious Godzilla fan comes across a strange copy of the movie Godzilla vs. Destroya in 1996. The movie had just been released in Japan and the only way to get a copy was to buy it straight from a Japanese distributor, which meant the author had to buy their copy from overseas. The VHS tape took a while to get to the author, but when it did arrive, he wasted no time watching it. The author noticed some differences in this copy and the one he'd seen prior. The first scene of the movie was on Birth Island and not in Hong Kong. Godzilla is watching over his son as he explores the island. Godzilla then grasps at his chest as it pulses. Godzilla lets out a scream as the screen goes white. The film then starts in Hong Kong again. This part of the movie is pretty normal, save for some missing sound effects here and there. Everything seems to be pretty close to the original, until the antagonist of the film, Destroya, shows up. The scene where Destroya picks up Godzilla's child is a bit different. Godzilla Jr. starts flailing around and shooting off his atomic breath. Destroya then throws Godzilla Jr. straight into the ground with a sickening crunch. The camera zooms in on a twitching Godzilla Jr. He starts to foam at the mouth as he struggles to move from where he is indented into the ground. A few moments later, Godzilla Jr. stops moving altogether. The movie then shows Destroya kill Godzilla by throwing him through a building and then shooting a beam of energy at him. The movie doesn't end there, however. The final scene is Destroya killing the JSDF forces as they show up to fight the beast. There exists a bootleg episode of Spongebob. Other than this image, the rest of the video is composed of incomprehensible jumbles of colors, static, or just black screens. The audio seems to be a heavily distorted version of the audio from the original episode with loud, droning buzzes occasionally interrupting it. The bootleg tape itself was found by a group of five urban exploring teenagers in a trash can within an abandoned mental institution. Of these five individuals, two have committed suicide, one has gone missing, one refuses to comment on the tape, and the last hastily agreed to give paranormal investigators the tape shortly after being interviewed about the suicide and disappearances of the other three people. The current whereabouts of the tape are unknown, and many who stare at this image for a long enough period of time claim to see Spongebob blink. If you stare at this image long enough, he will blink. The teenager that's gone missing was found dead in a dustbin a year later after the discovery of the tape. I myself am one of the people that witnessed the incident. I was chilling at home one night scrolling through channels on the remote and found that an episode of Spongebob was airing on Nick. I was bored at the time because I didn't know what to do that would keep me entertained, so I decided to watch it. The episode that was on was Your Shoes Untied slash Gary Takes a Bath, though I believe I missed part of this first episode. I continued watching, but I noticed something odd. When Patrick said, hey Spongebob, after Spongebob tripped in the Krusty Krab, Spongebob wouldn't move. He wouldn't even reply, he just laid there. Patrick was confused at this. Spongebob, he asked. But Spongebob didn't reply. He just laid there on the floor as the camera zoomed in on him. Then, Spongebob got up for a split second twice, which made it look like he was gasping for air. He continued to stay on Spongebob's body until cutting to static after a few minutes. Now, I've seen this episode a million times, but this wasn't in it. It cuts to Spongebob laying on the floor, but he's now in the kitchen at the Krusty Krab. A few seconds later, it cuts to Spongebob's body in a black room, floating in the air in a different direction but in the same pose. Then it immediately cut to Spongebob and Gary sitting in the huge shoe at the end of the episode while Gary slightly moved up and down while a weird distorted music track played in the background. After a few more seconds, it cut to static, and then went black. 
After a minute of nothing but the black screen, the episode Gary Takes a Bath started playing. The episode started out pretty normal, but halfway through the episode there was a split second scene of Spongebob in a distorted visual with Gary. They were just staring at the screen, smiling creepily, and then cut to static again. I was confused if this was even the real episode or just some glitch. I tried shutting it off and turning it back on, but the episode stayed the same. I decided to just turn off the TV and went to bed. The next morning, I went and turned on the TV and saw that everything was back to normal. To this day, I still have so many questions about this drug trip of an episode. Was I having a bad dream? Was the TV hijacked? To this day, I still don't know what the heck was going on at the time. It's been a couple of years since the incident, I still don't have any answers, or even after searching through the internet for hours on end. To this day, no one knows how this incident occurred or who or what caused it, but I am determined to find this out for myself. One of these days, this mystery will be solved. I usually like to watch TV with my little sister, Kimberly. She was only five, so of course she watched all the cutesy kids shows. I didn't really mind though. They made her happy and I liked spending time with her. She watched shows like Dora, Blue's Clues, and Arthur. We often had a lot of DVDs of old kids shows running around the house that we would watch occasionally. There was a large box of old movies and TV shows in the attic. I took a brief look at it once, but none of them looked like they would appeal to her. One day, Kimberly was at a doctor's appointment and I thought I'd have time to watch a movie aimed more towards my age range. So I thought this would be a good time to look through the box of old movies in the attic. While I looked through the box, I noticed that these movies didn't really interest me, but I kept looking in hopes of finding something. Then I saw at the bottom of the box, a DVD labeled Colwyn's Corner. Many memories started to come back to me. I used to watch this show as a kid. It was about an orange puppet named Colwyn who lived in a house on the corner of the street. He would often have his other puppet friends come over to play games and sing songs. It was cute and innocent, and I remember really liking it as a kid. I thought this would be a good show for my sister and I to watch. When Kimberly got home, I told her I got a new show for us to watch. She got excited and sat down on the couch while I put the disc in. I sat down next to her as the selection screen popped up. The screen looked just as I remembered. It showed Colin and his friends in front of the house. I chose the first episode and the theme song began. I was a little confused. The colors were a lot darker than I remember and the song was sung a lot slower and in a deeper voice. I didn't think much of it as I hadn't seen the show in a long time and I probably forgot some elements of it. The show began pretty normally. Colin was in his house and said hello to the viewers. There was a knock on his door and he said, I think my friends are here. When he opened the door, I felt my heart go to my throat. Standing at the door were two tall, white puppets with no nose or mouth, only pitch black eyes. I was shocked because I don't even remember these characters on the show. Even the cover of the DVD showed two colorful, friendly puppets. I looked over at Kimberly and she had this big smile on her face. I was confused since an image like this would terrify a child. I'm not sure if we should watch this anymore, I told her. No, please keep it on, she exclaimed. I continued watching as the giant puppets didn't seem to phase her. The two larger puppets came into the house. Colin asked, what do you guys want to do today? The one puppet replied with the most horrific sound it ever heard. It sounded like a man was shouting almost screaming in a strange language. The audio was very distorted. At this point, I got up and ejected the disc from the player, much to Kimberly's disappointment. Why did you stop it? Put it back on, she said. I didn't listen and put the DVD in a drawer. Even though Kimberly wasn't bothered by the show, I still thought it was too disturbing for a five-year-old. I had trouble sleeping that night. I kept thinking about the video. I watched that show all the time when I was younger. I definitely have seen every episode. I didn't understand why I didn't remember an episode like this. I was still curious about the rest of the episode. I decided to go downstairs to finish it. I took the DVD out of the drawer and put it back into the player. I put on my headphones so the noise wouldn't disturb my family. The episode began the same, with the strange intro and the large puppets. After the one puppet made the terrifying sound, Colin replied, you're right, we should play a game. He then grabbed a knife off the counter. It cuts to a live action arm painted orange to represent Colin's. The knife went up to the arm and started to cut slits. 
each one deeper than the last. Colwyn started to scream, a blood-curdling scream. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. I felt sick to my stomach. Blood gushed out of the wounds as the screams got louder and louder. It cuts to a live-action neck-painted orange. The knife went up to the throat and cut a deep slit in it. The blood began gushing out. It showed Colin gasping heavily for air before his eyes turned completely white. The episode ended with him falling onto the floor as the two tall, white puppets looked directly at the camera with pitch-black eyes. I was utterly terrified at this point. I immediately ejected the DVD and threw it in the trash. I couldn't sleep at all that night. I kept thinking about that episode. I got up the next morning and went downstairs to get some breakfast. I walked past Kimberly's room and saw that she wasn't in there. When I got downstairs, I saw her on the couch finishing up the horrific episode I watched last night. I immediately grabbed the remote and turned off the TV. Why did you do that? She asked. Where did you get the DVD? It was in the garbage, she replied. I took it out because I wanted to finish the episode. This show is very bad, I said. No, no it's not. They were just baking a cake. What? The episode was about Colin and his friends baking a cake. I was shocked. What did his friends look like, I asked. One was blue and one was red, she replied. I really liked it. Can I watch it again? My Poor Snippy is supposed to be the last episode of the show ever created for Nickelodeon. It was created by the original creator in every aspect. He wrote the episode, animated, and even did the voice work. The episode was so bad that it caused the show to be pulled and never aired on Nick ever again. The episode starts with Ren receiving an autographed vinyl in the mail. He places the vinyl on the mantle and tells Stimpy not to mess with it. Ren then punched Stimpy in the stomach and told him never go near it. This scene ended with Stimpy on the ground crying while looking up at the record. In a later scene, Stimpy accidentally threw a ball through the window, almost hitting the record. While climbing up the mantle to get his ball, he falls and brings the record down with him. Ren then enters to see what had caused the noise and finds Stimpy on the ground with his now broken record. The scene then zooms in on Ren's face as pure hatred burns in his eyes. The sound of Stimpy crying could be heard as the scene cut to black. A final scene showed Ren sitting on the couch watching TV with a random black mass in the corner of the room. The camera zoomed in until you could see that it was Stimpy's mangled corpse lying in the corner with the pieces of the broken record all around him. In the Night Garden was a British television show created for young children. The creepypasta supposes a true sad backstory to the show, one in which the author claims to be dark and depressing. The show starts with a child out to sea with a little light and a blanket for a sail. This always struck the author as being a little odd. The child was also blue for some reason. The creepypasta then goes on to explain the characters in the show in relation to the real world. Like the main kid's best friend being a girl named Upsy Daisy, because his best friend in the real world is named Daisy. This is because the whole world of the show takes place inside the kid's mind. He's imagining it to escape his terrible home life where his parents drink and use drugs. They have no love for their son, but they do drop him off at a daycare every day. The daycare is where he gets most of the ideas for his adventures. Each person he meets relates to a character in the show. The old man that comes to the nursery to read to the kids is actually the narrator of the show. One day, the kid's father comes to pick him up, but instead of going home, they drive to the beach. At the beach, the kid is picked up and wrapped in his blanket before being placed in a wooden boat. The father pushes his kid out to sea. The little boy, wrapped in his favorite blanket, slowly turns blue as hyperthermia takes him. The author grew up just outside of Toronto. His parents had left him the house and were moving but asked him to check to see if they'd left anything behind in the basement. In the basement is where he found a VHS tape labeled Frankie Pig Visits Niagara Falls. The tape was found in a box labeled Kids Movies. The box had other movies that the author remembered, like VeggieTales, Peter Pan, and the Berenstain Bears. This movie though, the author didn't remember ever watching. The synopsis on the back of the box read, From the studio that brought you Frankie Pig's Big Adventure, Canada's favorite farm friend is back in a feature-length adventure. When Farmer Casey lets the farm animals go on a vacation, troublemaking Frankie Pig decides to jump ship at Niagara Falls, making friends and learning lessons as he tries to find Farmer Casey and the others. The movie seemed innocent enough. 
He also decides to watch it and see if maybe he'd just forgotten it for some reason. He pulled out a VHS player and inserted the tape. The movie starts with a woman, probably Farmer Casey, talking to the camera about how the animals are going on vacation. She then asks the viewers to help wake up each of the animals, except for Frankie, who they find hiding in a puddle of mud. So far the film is a pretty standard childhood affair. The farm animals and Farmer Casey are traveling around Canada and visiting their famous landmarks. They go over the history of each landmark as they visit them. When the crew gets to Niagara Falls is when everything changes. As soon as Frankie Pig separates from the group, the cute animated pig turns into a real man wearing a distorted pig mask. The man still spoke like he was being voiced by a young child. Only this time the child sounded like he was reading his lines while trying not to cry. It was so disturbing seeing the man's mouth move and a scared child's voice come out. Eventually the man in a pig mask found a woman dressed as Farmer Casey. She stood at the end of an alley with four other men in various animal masks walking up behind her. Frankie Pig had a knife in his hand, so did the four men behind the woman. The scene then transitions to the farm again. The five men are all stabbing the actress who was portraying Farmer Casey. The author decided to stop watching after that. He did some investigating into the background of the company that made the film, Funbox Entertainment. He found a number associated with their company. The author called and talked to someone about finding their film. They seemed confused as if they'd never heard of it before. They did ask for an address so they could come pick it up though. The author gave them a fake address. He finished the movie which concluded with the five men throwing the body of former Casey into Niagara Falls. He took the tape to the police and explained everything to them. The final update the author gives is that there was a fire at the fake address that they had given. Angry Sylvester is a lost episode of Looney Tunes. The episode starred Sylvester the Cat and only appeared on local TV broadcasts in Hungary. The episode itself was also in Hungarian, even though official Hungarian dubbing of the Cartoon Network wasn't available at the time of airing. The episode started with a title screen, but there were no words on screen. Just a living room in the background, colored in both black and red. Weird shapes dotted the rooms and were also in the same color scheme. The episode transitioned to Sylvester standing in front of a military base. I say transitioned, but it wasn't really a transition. The screen just abruptly changed from that odd title screen to this new scene. A bruised and battled Sylvester walked towards the military base. His eyes had no pupils and looked like white voids. He entered the military buildings and started to cut down the lights from the ceiling with his now massive claws. The only sound in the scene was the electric buzz of the lights being destroyed. It was very clear that the military had experimented on Sylvester. That could be the reason he had pure white eyes and giant claws. It's never stated exactly what caused these changes in him. The rest of the creepypasta follows a similar formula of showing creepy images mixed with trippy colors. The story ends with a very angry Sylvester staring at the screen for 10 seconds before the next show begins. I am a full-blown Tintinologist. I got all the comics at home, even the rare and elusive Tintin in the land of the Soviets. Recently I asked my bestie to burn me DVDs of the whole Tintin cartoons, you know the 1990s cartoons, and she gladly accepted. The whole series would usually take 10 DVDs each containing two episodes. Oddly enough, she gave me an 11th. While all the others had their official artwork, this one simply had Tintin's portrait on it. I decided to pop it into my DVD player. This one had no French English menu. It directly jumped to the episode. The intro came up as usual in English as opposed to the others that all had the French intro. Then the episode panel displayed Tintin and the end of the world. Tintin and Haddock were underground for some spelunking when suddenly, blam, crashing sounds of all kinds echoed from everywhere. Worried, Tintin tugged at Haddock's sweater saying, great snakes, captain. We gotta check out what's going on above. When they came back to the surface, it was a post-apocalyptic mess. The earth was looking like the moon, but with buildings on fire all around. I saw some Hergi-style corpses all around too. Chang, Abdullah, 
Zarino, the Thompsons, Cuthbert, Bianca, etc. I could even see some villains such as Rastopoulos and Dr. Mueller. I knew they were dead when Tintin checked some of them over. Not a pulse, he said as tears were running down his cheeks. Every one of them, they were all dead. Well, Captain, it looks like we're the only survivors on planet Earth. I guess we can't consider ourselves doomed. As Tintin declared those words, Haddock also shed a tear. Then, the ending credits rolled down as usual. I let the name slide before my eyes, still in shock from the whole scene. I knew my bestie could not have done this episode. She was able to draw with Lynn Clare. The question is, how would Herrick write such a horrific story? And most importantly, when? It wasn't featured in any comic, so how could this episode come into existence? Would it be a spin-off like Tintin and the Lake of Sharks? Why would Ellipse accept such a grim scenario? Tired and sleepy, I passed out on my couch. The episode was still airing on my mind as I slept, disturbing the quality of my rest. Half-Baked Sun Cakes is a My Little Pony creepy pasta. The author used to record all of the MLP episodes on their DVR and was sitting down to watch the show. He had seven episodes saved and scrolled down to watch the most recently saved episode. The preview for the episode looked nothing like the episode that it was supposed to be. The author clicked the episode to see what actually was recorded. The episode starts with Twilight Sparkle sitting alone in her house. She's talking to a spike doll about all the plans she has for the day, which includes baking sun cakes for the princess of Ponyville. The episode title screen called it Half-Baked Sun Cakes, which wasn't an episode that the author had ever heard of. He'd seen every episode of the show, or so he thought. This episode had season one's opening, but was playing season two's song. The episode continued with Twilight leaving her home and talking to herself as she walked around. The strangest part was she appeared to be talking to her friends. She would say something, then wait a second, then talk again. Twilight was clearly alone. There was no one around that she could be talking to. The entire town of Ponyville was empty. Yet, she went on talking to no one and acting as if they were talking back to her. The episode carried on like a normal episode. They had a plot where the sun cakes were misplaced and the ponies needed to search the town for them, which was just Twilight walking around and interacting with objects and people but nothing happened. The show ended with Twilight looking at the screen and starting to cry as the camera zoomed out. It zoomed out to show the house, then the empty town, finally a shot of the entire kingdom. All empty. You might have already heard of the TV broadcast hijacking in Seneca, South Carolina. The story gained pretty wide currency on the internet and part of the broadcast is available on YouTube, assuming it hasn't been taken down for whatever reason. For the uninitiated, the Serena hijacking is one of the lesser known broadcast signal intrusions. It was big news here, but the national news media barely touched on it. Anyway, I've decided to jot down my impressions of the whole thing even though other eyewitnesses have already described it more eloquently than I ever could. I was home on winter break when it happened, making chemistry flashcards in front of the TV. No one else was around. After watching the Upteeth Law & Order rerun, I got bored and started channel surfing. A couple minutes later, I stumbled upon this public access channel where bizarrely enough, my old high school Latin teacher was reciting a poem while wearing this dorky three-cornered hat. I watched for a few minutes and had a good laugh. I remembered him as a pretty serious guy, not the sort of person who'd embarrass himself in public like this. When suddenly there was a staticky crackle and the scene cut to this multicolored test pattern. Before I had time to change the channel, there's another crackle and this weird cartoon shows up on screen. The animation style was detailed but kind of jiggly and rough. It reminded me of those old anti-drug PSAs. Anyway, it seemed normal enough at the time. An ordinary looking middle class family eating breakfast together at a round kitchen table. There was a mom with an old fashioned hairdo, a dad, two cherub faced kids, a boy and a girl, all very Norman Rockwell. The family is making banal small talk. The dad complains about his day at the office, the kids prat about their soccer practice, and so on. Gradually though the scene starts to get slightly sinister. A green light is seeping through the open window and the family starts to acquire a jaundiced, unhealthy look. Their skin changes color, and their eyes become sunken. In the background, a droning radio broadcast slowly becomes perceptible. The announcer gives the date of November 15th, 2017, and starts to go on and on about some strange crisis. You can barely hear what he's saying. He's saying something about a green light, melting flesh, 
mutations, strange shapes emerging from the sea again and again. The phrase, report to the nearest shelter, immediately is audible. Still, the family keeps eating breakfast as if nothing is happening. And here's where it gets really macabre. The family finishes eating breakfast and the mom loads the kids into a minivan. But now they look really unhealthy. Their bodies are skeletally thin, the whites of their eyes are sickly yellowish color, and their hair is disheveled. The car drives through a landscape bathed in the green glow from before. Strange shapes bob in and out of the screen, but you can't actually tell what they are. And all the buildings the car passes look weathered and deserted. Finally, the car stops at a playground and the mom drops off the kids before driving away. There are large, odd-colored rocks all over the ground and moaning can be heard in the distance. The kids hang mirthlessly on the monkey bars for a while. Eventually, the camera pans over to the playground and you see the rocks littering the ground aren't rocks at all, but naked human forms horribly disfigured. They seem to be either growing into or from the ground. I can't say which, and they are very much alive. Behind the monkey bars, a tree can be seen with a human face, growing from the trunk. Its features are writhing and contorted in agony. The scene suddenly shifts to a white collar office where the children's father is stooped over a desktop, typing away. His features are as sunken and diseased as that of the other family members, and the office is covered in a green glow. In the other cubicles, fleshless corpses sit upright on their desks, frozen in death. Finally, we see the family return home for the evening walking through the front door together. Their skin is no longer simply jaundiced, but actually melting off, dripping from their outstretched arms and running down their faces in drops, as they are literally falling to pieces. The family sits down in the dining room and begins wordlessly eating dinner. Their flesh becomes more and more amorphous, ribbons of skin dangling from their bodies like the tendrils of an octopus. I can barely describe it, but they somehow begin to merge with the chairs they are seated on, or rather, their skin grows over them. By now, their skin has the consistency of melted ice cream, and they are barely recognizable as human, except for their eyes, which somehow remain intact. The camera zooms closer and closer to the table, and finally their eyes all move directly towards the camera, conveying a feeling of unfathomable sadness. The screen goes black, and large white letters appear on the screen. Report to the nearest shelter immediately. Remaining at private residences is strictly prohibited. And with that, the screen turned to static. I stared in stunned silence for a few minutes before the banal local channel switched back on. And that's all I know. Really, I almost thought I was dreaming until the paper reported the story the next day. God knows what really happened. A ridiculously elaborate prank? An ill-advised viral marketing campaign? The craziest part of the internet have their own theories. Legend of the Hidden Temple was a game show where teams of two kids each would have to make their way through different obstacles to win a prize. The show was very popular when it was on. There were six teams, but originally they had seven teams. This seventh team was the Yellow Frogs, which they retired after the pilot episode. The pilot episode of the show was never shown on air. The reason for that was that an accident had happened on stage that no one could figure out. The pilot episode would be the only appearance of the Yellow Frogs. The episode featured the skull of the first leader of the Aztec people. It sat in the throne room of the Hidden Temple. The show never explained how it got there. The show had three different games that the players had to compete in to get a shot at doing the temple run. The first game was the moat. The teams had to make their way across a rope bridge to the other side. It was simple enough, and there was water beneath the players to catch them if they fell. The moat had small rapids that would make this game a little more challenging. But for some reason the water seemed to be boiling during this event. The water turned red and it was hot to the touch, leaving burn marks if it splashed on the players. Many of the players turned back, but four teams did make it through. The second challenge was the Steps of Knowledge. This was a quiz show of sorts, where the contestants were told a story and then had to answer questions about it. During this event, Olmec, the giant head that would ask questions, kept powering down. Finally, when he powered down for the last time, Spiders started to crawl out of his mouth. The contestants weren't bitten, so they moved on. The two teams that won the challenge were the Yellow Frogs and the Silver Snakes. This would mean both teams would compete in the final challenge, the Temple Games. The Temple Games were the most tame of the three challenges. 
The teams thought they heard noises while playing through the games, but there wasn't anything weirder than that. The Yellow Frogs once again won this game and were moving on to the Temple Run. During the Temple Run, the girl was grabbed by one of the guards and pulled into a room. Deafening screams could be heard, but she was gone. The second kid went in and met a similar fate to a guard with a glowing green knife. The producers stopped the games and went to search the temple for the kids. All they found were two sets of bones. The kids were never found, and the show quietly pulled the yellow frogs from the team list. The strangest part is that the bones ended up matching the two kids that went missing. Batman the Animated Series is probably one of the most faithful adaptations of the Caped Crusader. It was also the author's favorite Batman series. They also mentioned that they are a bit obsessed with the series and that Jonathan Crane, the Scarecrow, was their favorite character. The author received a DVD from a friend with a lost episode on it. The episode in question actually featured Scarecrow as the main antagonist. This excited the author, who wasn't just getting a new episode of Batman, but also his favorite character. The author hurriedly put his new DVD into the player and started the new episode. It started with Batman and Robin looking for Scarecrow. They found him, but he'd been changed into a child for some reason. I'm just going to summarize the ending really quickly here. The story isn't really good. It's not that bad, but definitely not good. Jonathan hates being a child and ends up hanging himself in his cell because Batman left a note for him telling him to do it. That's it. There's not much more to say about this story. On to the next one. I'm not sure where to start on this creepypasta. This is by far the most edgy creepypasta I've ever read in my entire life. And I've read a lot of edgy creepypastas. This story goes beyond being edgy and goes into its own category of story. Let me give you a quick summary. My Little Pony Goodwill DVD is about a brony who buys a DVD from Goodwill, like the title says. They explain where they live and how it's very country. The actual episode on the DVD has Fluttershy going on a murderous rampage. The character appears to be dressed like a school shooter and also appears to idolize those people. She kills everyone for whatever reason she gives, in mostly grotesque ways. There's a very disgusting scene between two characters that I won't mention for fear of being demonetized. Just know it's all pretty gross. Fluttershy also kills both of these characters. I'm not sure if it's supposed to be a troll poster or not, but it goes to some crazy lengths to display some grotesque imagery. The episode ends with Fluttershy killing herself in a courtroom. It was a pretty shocking, but kind of obvious ending of the episode. There's a little more to it, but it's just more of the same. I wouldn't really recommend this to you. None of you. This creepypasta is pretty long, mostly just shocking content, and references a lot of real world tragedies. If you have a taste for shocking content, then you can check the story out. If you just want a scary and interesting story, please look elsewhere. In some television markets, people get two different versions of the same channel. This is usually caused by affiliates being nearby. For example, while living in New Jersey receiving the ABC affiliate from both New York City and Philadelphia, or living in Southern California and getting both Los Angeles and San Diego stations. For the most part, these appear to be the same channel, in all except local news and some daytime programming, with the exception that one is actually closer and more clear than the other. These channels, in reality, should not occur. Television markets are set up to focus around one city, and offering two different channels of the same channel in one market can split viewership in the ever-competitive ratings race. If you are to watch the channel with worse reception from the city that is further away, you'll start to notice that the news reports major events that never occurred, on people that aren't real, on technology that shouldn't exist, the ads are for products that you've never heard of. The conspiracy theorists think these television stations belong to an alternate world, they point to the fact that the news tends to be getting worse over there, more separate from our own. There are reports of looking into an alternate world and invading it for their own. Just pray they aren't talking about us. The author wants to get his wife an obscure cartoon that she's never seen before. While at work, one of his co-workers talks about a VHS he found in his attic that has a cartoon on it from his home country. The author thought he'd found the jackpot and took the VHS off of him. As soon as he got home, he put it in his VHDR and started it up. It looked to be a pretty artsy cartoon, and possibly a little pretentious, which is what the author's wife loved. 
The author decided to watch the cartoon first. The first episode was a little odd, with just a man waking up and walking to a lone building. The art was pretty well done, but nothing really seemed to happen throughout the episode. That is, until the man gets to the lone building. Walking inside, he sees three girls sitting in the corner with thermoses. One of the girls throws the container of her thermos at him, and they all start laughing. The man leaves, and the other two throw the thermoses at him as well as he's walking away. The episode ends with a close-up of his burned face. The second episode has the man sewing a doll at his bedroom desk. The wounds from the previous episode are gone, like they never happened in the first place. The man sews the doll's face until it's entirely covered in black thread, with its eyes X'd out. The episode ends after a close-up of the doll. The third episode is almost identical to the happenings of the first episode, except in a different art style. When the man approaches the lone building, the three girls who had harassed him aren't there. The man enters what looks to be a lecture hall. The professor is giving a lesson at the front of the class. He appears really passionate about what he is saying, until his face seems to grow flush and the beads of sweat start forming on his forehead. The professor then begins to choke and clutch at his throat. No one in the audience reacted to this at all. His eyes began to bleed before he collapsed to the ground twitching in a pool of his own blood. The episode ended with everyone calmly getting up and leaving the auditorium. The episodes got progressively weirder and slightly darker, but the next disturbing part happens in episode 8. There's a person who's trapped under a blanket on a bed. They keep squirming, but it's obvious that the covers are strapped to the sides of the bed. The squirming eventually stops as the episode ends. Then it was time for episode 11. The title of this episode was, This One Is My Favorite. The episode's animation was completely different from the rest of the cartoons. This episode appeared to be rotoscoped, which is the same animation they used for the Take On Me music video. The episode had the three girls from before all tied up and unconscious in the man's room. He slowly killed each one of them in a gruesome way. He stabbed one girl in the neck after yelling at her, then proceeded to do the same thing to the other girls. After he was done, he pulled out a cell phone and started recording what he'd done. That's when the author got suspicious. How old was this tape? Cell phones shouldn't have existed this time, especially not the iPhone he was seeing. The author immediately called his coworker that he got the cartoon from. After explaining what he'd seen and how it was sick, he was met with confusion from his coworker, who had actually never watched the VHS. A moment later, the author heard his wife scream from the bedroom. When he ran in, he saw XII carved into the glass. On the windowsill was a doll with the face covered in the black yarn. The author called the police, and when he went to show them the tape, the VCR was on fire. It was impossible to get the tape out without burning himself, but there were still some words on the screen. He couldn't make out what they said. With the evidence now gone, there wasn't much the author could do. He decided to translate the words on screen as they were now permanently burnt into the TV. They read, Episode 12, Coming Soon. A man buys his daughter a Powerpuff Girls DVD from a Japanese seller online. The episode wasn't anything he'd seen before, but it looked interesting. The seller told him it would be unlike anything he'd ever seen before. This confused the man, but he proceeded to buy it anyway. After buying it, he noticed the age requirement was 18 on the box. That didn't make sense though, since Powerpuff Girls was a pretty family-friendly show. The show could get a little violent sometimes, but never to the level that it would be considered for adults only. He decided he would watch the DVD after his daughter went to bed. The same night he'd received the DVD, he put his daughter to sleep and went into the living room. He put the DVD in and loaded it up. The DVD was pretty bare with just menu selections, no background music or images. The DVD had a two-part episode titled Bubbles. The man started up Bubbles Part 2 and was greeted by the professor. The professor was staring at the moon for a full minute before walking inside. He sat in his chair by the fireplace and just stared blankly into space. The only audio that could be heard was the sound of his breathing. Eventually the professor gets up to go check on the girls. Making his way up the stairs, you could hear something moving just out of frame. At the end of the hall was a short white form with red circles surrounding blue eyes. The creature moved towards the professor, and as he fell into a fetal position, it was gone. He stared into the now empty hallway. Getting up, he made his way to the door to the girl's room. Inside, Blossom and Buttercup were asleep in their bed. The professor looked at the spot where Bubbles was supposed to be, but it was empty. At the edge of the bed was a white form that was slowly rising, its eyes fixed on the camera. The man stopped the DVD for a moment. He had heard noise from inside his house and couldn't tell where it was coming from. He took a moment to compose himself before returning to the menu and starting part one instead. 
Part 1 started with the professor mixing something in his lab. The three Powerpuff Girls were floating in the air behind him. Bubbles slowly crept towards whatever the professor was making and inhaled the fumes by accident. Alright, so this is where the story gets kind of hard to follow. Live action footage starts playing instead of the cartoon and it involves a man recording the screams of children as they run away from something. The same DVD case can be seen in the live action footage. The man says it's supposed to be a warning about the DVD, but that also doesn't make sense. Then something hits the camera and it gets covered in red. Somehow a real life monster had come from the DVD and was now attacking the seller, but that doesn't make sense. The creepypasta then ends with a Bubbles plushie being found in the bag where the DVD had once been. You guys know that Adult Swim sign-off bumper, The Dawn is Your Enemy? There's a reason they don't show it anymore. The last day the bump was used, a sign-off instead of a normal running time of estimated 9 seconds, it ran for an extended period of time until the automated service were overtaken by a manual operation. We all know the sound that shook our childhoods or teen years, the resonating metal, the rumbles, the sound of metal scraping against metal. Feel free to look it up if you're a bit rusty. Now when the audio cut, it doesn't sound complete. It's not finished, not over. The producers of Adult Swim Cartoon Network were purposely cutting off the rest of the sound, and for good reason. The rest that followed was the exact reason why you'll never see this bumper again on the air. Once again, it supposedly only runs for about 9 seconds, and this is a rough transcript of the usual audio. Resonating metal followed by a rumble, followed by scraping metal and other rumbles. End bumper. So what could you put together with that? Nothing rings a bell, right? Exactly. This part they used is utilized effectively to scare off children that have still tuned in to Adult Swim. It even gives adults goosebumps because it's that good. It's closely rivaled with the hammer clinks in the William Street production card in Nightmare Fuel. Getting back on topic, usually a Cartoon Network employee would enter the control room left by an Adult Swim crew member and take over for a day. It wasn't quite the case that day, however. The usual man scheduled to cue the sign-on and such programming for CN for some reason did not start up the day schedule. No one knows if he did this purposely and whether or not his contract was terminated. This was the least of problems CN had at the time. What followed the common 9 seconds was an extended 2 minute broadcast of some of the most horrifying audio ever heard on public television. The metal continued to resonate and the scrapings continued. Slowly an uncontrollable sobbing came clear. Not one person was crying, but a multitude of people were screaming and yelling. As the metal scraped the screaming grew louder. Soon you could hear the slicing of flesh the grinding of bones, the gushing of blood, and the guttural death rattles of people dying. All across the United States, millions of children and adults were being exposed to what sounded like a barbaric mass murder. People were calling in all across the country, crying or screaming or begging for it to be turned off. Something kept their eyes attached to the screen and kept them listening to the broadcast. People assumed the control room was finally gotten into and the bump was shut down. Ending a traumatic experience no one could undoubtedly forget in the last few moments, as the resonating metal grew into an unbearable volume, the channel showed the peaking sun winking at the viewer, and the channel cut to bars and tones. How was Cartoon Network ever going to cover this up? No one knows their exact tactic to this day. Multiple theories have been thought of, ranging from a preemptive cease and desist, to possibly news articles, to subliminal viewer hypnosis over the following weeks. While all public evidence does not officially exist, Cartoon Network officials do acknowledge a hijacking of the channel's frequency on that day, but go into no further detail. All late morning bumps, including TDIYE, were replaced with the corresponding ones from the 1.30 a.m. time slot. Word is, however, that somewhere hidden in an Onion site is a recording of the bump played that morning. The question asked the most among the few who remember it is how Cartoon Network got the audio in the first place. The author is a big fan of the cops TV show. He grew up watching it with his grandpa and thought it was amazing since his grandfather used to be a cop. The two together gave him a big love for the show. He was excited when he saw that there was a special live episode of Cops that was going to premiere on TV that weekend. The author got everything together before the weekend. He got popcorn and drinks and readied himself in front of the TV for a dose of nostalgia. It had been years since he'd watched the show. The episode started with two presenters talking about how the cops show works and moved on to the first location. A young cop is in a parking lot talking to a suspect that is freaking out and clutching his stomach. The cop is approaching him slowly and the man is muttering something. 
It burns, he says. The cop asks him if he's on anything. The man ignores him and starts to yell for help. The cop zaps the man with his taser, and he falls down with a loud thud. The cop walks over and starts to cuff him, but the man's body lurches forward, and he starts to growl. The man starts to grow hair all over his body as the cop tries to keep him detained. The video cuts away and goes to static. The presenters come back and look very confused, but quickly compose themselves. The presenters say they're not sure what happened to the feed and immediately cut away to another cop. The feed is for a southern sheriff who's patrolling with a cameraman. The pair come across a tall man in a long coat and top hat. It's pretty late at night, so the sheriff asks the man what he's doing out so late at night. The tall man turns and starts to hobble away. The sheriff asks him to stop before the tall man breaks into a full-on sprint. The sheriff gives chase before the tall man then jumps over a building. The sheriff curses under his breath and hops in his police car. The pair begin to chase the tall man, but lose sight of him. The pair looks into the cool night and don't see or hear anything. Something then crashes onto the hood of the car and broke the windshield, causing both the sheriff and the cameraman to jump back. The sheriff pulls out his gun and starts shooting at something on the car. The sound of the thing can be heard. First it sounded like it was in pain, but then it started to sound more like it was amused. The creature stuck its hand through the windshield and grabbed the sheriff before pulling him out into the night. The video then cuts away to the two presenters, who looked very shocked. They explained that they were having technical difficulties and cut to reruns of the show. The author of Ruby's Afternoon Snack was interested in taking an animation class at their high school. The first day of class, they're given an assignment to create any animation that they want, which worried the author since they were new to animation and had no idea where to start. The teacher then gave them a few rules. The animation must be created by the student and it can't be stolen from anywhere else. It was okay to animate a cartoon that already exists, as long as you aren't just stealing from the cartoon. And finally, the animation can't depict explicit, violent, or graphic content. After a minute of not knowing what they were going to do in the class, another student approached him. This student was named Nathan, and he explained how he would help the author with their animation. Nathan explained how he was making an animation based on Max and Ruby. The author was familiar with the show and actually liked it growing up. They're confused on why that was what they chose though. Eventually Nathan asked for the author's name, to which he replied with Stan. Nathan told Stan that he would work on the animation and that he could sit and wait for him to finish. After three hours he was done, but Stan was told that he couldn't see it until the next day. After seeing the title, Ruby's Afternoon Snack, Stan was interested in what the animation was about. He overheard one of the two students who did the voice acting for the video mention something about Ruby looking absolutely crazy. This was enough for Stan to ask the teacher to let him watch the video early. Stan got permission from Nathan, and the teacher and Stan watched the video together. The animation started with Ruby having a tea party before Max proceeded to ruin everything. He tied their hairs together on the dolls and took clothes from one and put it on another doll. Generally things he knew would annoy his sister. Finally, he put mud with worms in her teapot. Ruby then goes ballistic and chases her brother around the house. She didn't look like a normal angry sibling. She looked like something inside of her had snapped. When she finally caught up to her brother, she grabbed him by the shoulders and inserted him into her mouth. She started to devour her brother. The sounds of screaming and then silence was nauseating. Stan's teacher was furious that this existed and proceeded to kick Nathan from the class. The animation he made hasn't left the author's nightmares. The Wyoming Incident, or the Wyoming Hijacking, is a lesser known case of television broadcast hijacking, hacking. A hacker managed to interrupt broadcasts from a local programming channel believed to serve several smaller communities in the county of Neobrera, and aired his, her own video. The video contained numerous clips of disembodied human heads showing various emotions and poses. The camera position changed often, usually every 10 to 15 seconds, and the video was often interrupted by a special presentation announcement. The video is mostly locally well-known and would probably not even be that popular if it were not for the effects it had on a few residents who watched it for an extended period of time. Complaints included vomiting, hallucinations, 
headaches, etc. While some believed it was paranormal, specialists have determined that the cause of these afflictions were frequencies played irregularly throughout the broadcast. In this clip, the frequency being played is somewhere between 17 and 19 hertz. This range of frequency when played for a long period of time causes the eyes to subtly vibrate, sometimes inducing visual hallucinations. This video is significant in that it is one of the most recent television hijackings. Such actions were rare even in the 80s and are even more rare today. The hacker has not yet been caught and all attempts to trace the video have been proven futile. An avid wrestling fan finds a copy of a never-before-seen WWF pay-per-view. It was called In Your House and was set during the slow months that didn't have a pay-per-view for viewing. The pay-per-view was pretty standard, with a Royal Rumble. There was also a cage match that seemed pretty interesting. Finally, there was an Inferno match between Kane and Mankind. The match seemed to be the most exciting so far. The match was going on, as you'd expect, with Kane and Mankind just exchanging blows. Kane then picks up Mankind and throws him outside of the ring and into the fire. Mankind caught fire, which is usually how you would win the match, but he was actually on fire. Fire was starting to burn his skin. You could see that he was clearly in pain and his skin started to sear. It wasn't long before JR got up with a fire extinguisher. It was too late to save Mankind though. This is when the author thought about if this was a real pay-per-view. Mankind was still in the WWF. He didn't face any serious injury that would kill him. According to some sources that he found online, Mankind was supposed to be played by a different wrestler before Mick Foley. The actor must have been the one that died before they recycled the character. He also decides to keep the tape for collecting purposes. The author receives an Invader Zim DVD from someone who worked at Nickelodeon. This person was a friend of a friend. He didn't believe that he actually worked at Nick, but he took the DVD nonetheless. After getting home with the DVD, the author started it up. It used old art from the show and only contained a few episodes. The author did note that they did contain his favorite episodes for some reason, which he thought was a little odd. The DVD also contained the test pilot episode, which was cool, but there was another episode on the disc. Episode 30 A and B. The author believes this could be the never aired 10 minutes to doom episode, which was supposed to be the final episode of the show. Zim is using his trash can elevator and his pack gets stuck and then gets ripped off. The pack is like a second brain that is attached to the spine of every member of Zim's species. Without them, they would die. Zim freaks out and asks his computer how long he has to live. The computer replies with 10 minutes. Gurr is playing with it just before Dib steals the pack. The show continues with Zim slowly dying. His skin is more gray than green and he appears to be leaking green fluid. Dib then gets stabbed in the stomach by tentacles that extend from the pack. The final scene shows a now dead Zim on the floor before transitioning to Dib. Dib is walking for a moment in a daze before falling on the sidewalk. The episode ends with a cut to black. Season 8 of Family Guy was supposed to be much darker than it was, according to the author of Family Guy The Dark Side of Season 8. The author claims to have worked on the team with Seth, the creator of Family Guy. The author also claims that there was a man named Steve that was acting as Seth's consultant. Steve always tried to incorporate overly graphic scenes to make the show more mature. The writers usually fought against the suggestions, but he'd come up with a more depraved scene to be added. If someone said that he was too violent, he would add some sexual theme instead. One of the scenes that he tried to include had Quagmire stalking and kidnapping a girl before killing her in his basement. Safe to say, this man didn't really want to make the show more mature, just more depraved which led to many fights with Steve and the rest of the team. Of course, most of what he wanted never got added, which was for the best, the author added. After the season had wrapped up, the author tried to find Steve, but found no record of him in the company files. He had just come in and suggested some of the darkest themes for the show and then vanished.
The Scarface VHS tape feels like a retelling of The Ring, but with Scarface characters. The author had just received a diary from their stepson, who had just taken their own life. Reading through it, he would find the truth about what happened. The stepson wrote how he had just lost his younger half-brother and cousin. They had each taken their own life in the same manner, a single gunshot wound to the head. The rest of the story explores the descent into madness of Manuel Rabenga. He received a CD and a tape after the funeral of his family. The CD contained footage of his half-sibling and cousin hanging out with their six friends. After watching the Scarface VHS tape, he starts to see Tony in the mirror. Once he even came up and stabbed him while he was staring into the mirror. His reflection fell to the ground in a bloody mess. The creepypasta ends with him taking his own life in the same way that his family had. Vegeta's Revenge is a creepypasta about Vegeta going on a murderous rampage and killing every character in Dragon Ball Z. The kid received a VHS tape with this episode and found it to be hard to pin down in the timeline. You know, I was actually going to try to make this story sound better and maybe salvage it a little bit, but I can't. Vegeta is a zombie who blames Goku for ruining him somehow. Then Vegeta proceeds to kill and eat characters from the show. Creepypasta is really just a weird attempt at being shocking. You definitely don't need to read this one. Not worth even mentioning, but I guess so it can be cataloged, here it is. A mother loves watching MLP with her daughter, but for some reason she can't find anything related to MLP in merchandise. She checked Etsy, Amazon, and eBay, and couldn't find anything. Her daughter one day brought home a vinyl figure of her favorite character from the show. The author isn't sure where she got the vinyl figure, but she thought it was fine. It wasn't hurting anything, and her daughter seemed happy. One night at a sleepover, the author's daughter let her friend borrow her MLP figure, and something happened. The girl hasn't been seen at school in a few days, and her daughter had her figure back. The figure was starting to creep out the author, who swears she heard her daughter having full conversations with the thing. The show was also not what it once was. The episodes were getting darker, crueler, and just altogether worse. One of the episodes had a pet being ripped apart by some of the ponies. The author's daughter watched this episode and thought it was funny. This was scaring the author, who had no idea what was going on. The episodes kept getting more disturbing. The ponies would gang up on one of the characters and beat her up. They ripped one of her wings off and threw her off of a cliff. They would torture characters in almost every episode. The mom finally had it and got rid of the doll. She then sent a very angry letter to Hasbro about their show and how it wasn't appropriate for kids. A week later, she got a response from Hasbro. Hasbro returned with, We thank you for your time to write us about this, but Hasbro has never nor will at this point in time have any plans for the creation of a My Little Pony show. And from what you've described in some of the episodes, I'm not sure if this is some sort of joke from you or another person. Hasbro is committed to children's entertainment and merchandise, and we would never create horrific shows that would torment our viewers. If you can give us more information about this, we will look into this. The author didn't understand. They did create it. It has their branding all over everything. A moment of silence surrounded her before she heard something in the background. The theme song of My Little Pony was starting to play. Her daughter warned her that taking the doll away was a very bad idea. I must have been six or seven when I lived in Lebanon. The country was ravaged by war at the time and murders were common and frequent. I remember during a particularly vicious era when the bombings rarely stopped, I would stay at home sitting in front of my television watching a very, very strange show. It was a kid's show that lasted about 30 minutes and contained strange and sinister images. To this day, I believe it was a thinly veiled attempt on the part of the media to use scare tactics to keep kids in place because the moral of every episode revolved around very uptight ideologies, stuff like bad kids stay up late, bad kids have their hands under the covers when they sleep, and bad kids steal food from the fridge at night. It was very weird and in Arabic to top it off. I didn't understand much of it, but for the most part, the images were very graphic and comprehensive. The thing that stuck with me the most, however, was the closing scene. It remained much the same in every episode. The camera would zoom in on an old, rusted, closed door, and as it got closer to the door, Strange and sometimes even agonizing screams would become more audible. It was extremely frightening, especially for children's programming. Then a text would appear on the screen in Arabic reading, that's where bad kids go. Eventually both the image and the sound would fade out and that would be the end of the episode. 
About 15 or 16 years later, I became a journalistic photographer. That show had been in my mind all my life, popping up in my thoughts sporadically. Eventually, I'd had enough and decided to do some research. I finally managed to uncover the location of the studio, where much of that channel's programming had been recorded. Upon further research, and eventually traveling on site, I found out it was now desolate and had been abandoned after the big war ended. I entered the building with my camera. It was burnt out from the inside. Either a fire had broken out or someone had wanted to incinerate all the wooden furniture. After a few hours of cautiously making my way into the studio and snapping pictures, I found an isolated out of the way room. After having to break through a few old locks and managing to break the heavy door open, I remained frozen in the doorway for several long minutes. Traces of blood, feces, and tiny bone fragments lay scattered across the floor. It was a small room and an extremely morbid scene. What truly frightened me though, what made me turn away and never want to come back, was the bolted, caged microphone hanging from the ceiling in the middle of the room. The Backyard Again's Playtime is Over isn't a lost episode creepypasta. Kind of in a similar vein to Cupcakes, Playtime is a fan fiction. It has somehow become popular enough in the community that it's considered a lost episode pasta now, even though the story isn't presented as an episode. I feel like every fandom has one of these, a story that demonizes the characters or world in which the characters exist. Cupcakes took its very child-friendly world and turned it upside down with several fan fictions and creepypastas. Pokemon has done the same. The demonizing of childhood media is at the forefront of creepypastas, especially video game and lost episode pastas. Something about taking something we all loved as children and making it disturbing is so fascinating to so many of us. The story of Playtime is Over is no different. The Backyardigans is a very simple kids show about friendship and teaching basic childhood lessons. The show aired on Nick and was fairly popular with kids. In Playtime is Over, the Backyardigans are kidnapped while on a camping trip. There's a crazed pig man who has been stalking the kids and waiting for his opportunity. He takes the kids to some grungy house out in the middle of the woods. The pig man then tortures some of the kids and kills two of them. The story is told through the perspective of two of the kid characters and in flashbacks while at the police precinct. This story goes from child abduction to torture and worse, and then to police investigation. The episode almost plays out like an episode of a cop show like Law & Order. It's interesting in some aspects, but really depraved in others. It feels way more like a dark fanfiction than a creepypasta. The story ends with the pig man going to death's row and the two remaining backyardigans getting to be the ones to execute them in the electric chair. The story is really disturbing and kind of gross, but if you really want to read it, you can find it online. A word of warning though, it is very long. There's not much more to say about this one. It's creepy, but more so disturbing. If you are a fan of the backyardigans, maybe skip this one. It might ruin some childhood memories you have. I remember a Spongebob episode that was altered heavily, but still remains in circulation today. This is One Course Meal from Season 7. In the episode, Mr. Krabs finds out that Plankton is horrified by whales, and uses it to his advantage. This is one of the least popular episodes of the show, due to the dark nature of the episode, even after the episode was heavily altered. Now how would I have seen this episode before it was edited? It's simple really. This is one of the seven Spongebob episodes that was released on the internet before it aired on TV. Always a big fan of the show, I was excited about the idea of having a Spongebob episode premiere on the internet before television. I rapidly reloaded the Nick page, and finally the episode came up. It was known as Plankton Got Served, though it was eventually changed. Most of the episode is identical to the one that is circulated today. Plankton manages to break into the Krusty Krab and ties up Mr. Krabs and Spongebob. As he is about to finally get the secret formula from Spongebob, Mr. Krabs' daughter Pearl walks in. This terrifies Plankton and causes him to run out. Plankton later claims his ancestors were eaten by whales, and that is why he fears them so. Mr. Krabs realizes this fear that Plankton has, and decides to use it against him. He dresses up as his daughter and begins to follow Plankton around, frightening him. Plankton decides he can no longer take it, and decides to make the ultimate decision. Plankton decides to commit suicide. Yes, this is still in the show today, you are free to watch it. Plankton waits for the bus as he lies in the street waiting to get run over. That is when Spongebob comes over to try to convince him to continue his existence. This is where the alteration in the two versions begins. Plankton fails to heed Spongebob's words and remains there. 
In the altered version that was shown, SpongeBob tells Plankton that it was Mr. Krabs as Pearl the entire time, and he gets up. In another altered version, SpongeBob says the same things, but Plankton refuses to believe him. SpongeBob decides that the only thing he can do to show him the truth is to drag Mr. Krabs outside. Soon after he leaves, the typical red bus comes speeding along. Plankton sits up and watches it hit him as everything fades to darkness. Plankton finds himself standing on a single platform, overlooking darkness. In the darkness, he sees whales, all looking up at him. There are members of his family he can faintly make out, calling for him to jump down. Plankton looks above and sees a light, a light he can scarcely believe. This would seem to represent heaven and hell. Plankton, resigned to his fate, jumps and plunges down into the darkness. This is when the episode ends, and the traditional credits for the show are shown, parallel to Plankton's descent into the darkness. Now some of you may say you saw the show as soon as it came available online, apparently not fast enough. After seeing the episode online, I reloaded the page to find the altered version shown on the website. I kept reloading, curious about how I had seen the first version. The only answer I can imagine for my viewing of the original episode was that the creators uploaded the wrong file, and moments after uploading it recognized such. I may be the only one who saw this version. I truly do not know the sick ambitions the creators of Spongebob had in mind with this episode. Why would a kid's show portray death? Why would a kid's show portray heaven and hell? Nonetheless, the unaltered version is impossible to find. I've searched as hard as I can, and I have failed to find anything legitimate about the episode I had seen. Nevertheless, I know what I saw. I know people won't believe me. People will accuse me of just trying to scare people. People would say I have no evidence. There are no photos. There's no video evidence of this occurrence. I only saw it once, and it never occurred to me to do such. I know the truth, and I want other people to know as well. Maybe, maybe someone out there saw this episode as well, so I can confirm it. Until then, I hope you enjoyed reading about my experience. The author found a VHS tape of Tom and Jerry that he was supposed to get as a gift from his aunt. It turns out that his aunt had gotten this gift before she'd been brutally murdered. The assailants had cut her head off before robbing the place. The tape in question started from the beginning. An episode titled Death of the French came on and had a guillotine in the background. This episode had Tom and Jerry as members of the Three Musketeers. The king had tasked Tom with keeping everything quiet so he could sleep. The episode featured your usual bout of Tom and Jerry violence, but was a little different. In a scene where Tom gets his tail stabbed by a knife, pinning him to the ground, instead his tail is cut off and the blood trail follows his now stump. The next scene is Tom with his tail again, and this theme continues throughout the episode. The episode ends when the king gets woken up and sentences Tom to death. A scene with Jerry and another mouse named Nibbles comes up where the two could hear a crowd shouting in the distance. Normally, the episode would end here with the sound of the guillotine falling. The episode, this time, continued. It showed Tom being dragged to the guillotine by an executioner. Tom fights back for a minute before another executioner comes out. The final scene shows the blade being dropped on Tom's neck. His head flies off and the blood spews from the wound. The creepiest part of this whole scene was how close it was to how the author's aunt had also met her end. Tom then turns into a ghost and goes to heaven. Of course, he gets sent to hell for not getting forgiveness from Jerry. In hell, he is being stabbed by the dog devil while in a cauldron. The author shops the tape after this and puts it away. He couldn't stop thinking about the VHS and decided to play League of Legends to help him settle down. He finally tired himself out enough that he was able to sleep. The next day, the author went to find the tape to watch it again, but found out that his mom had donated it to a local Goodwill. The author wasn't able to find the tape as it had already been sold. Now someone else will have to live with the terrifying tape that he had to witness. Never Never is a creepypasta about a lost episode of regular show. It's not very good. I'm just going to say that. Nothing happens in this lost episode. A girl's watching the episode with a friend and then stuff just kind of happens. Alright, let, let me explain. Mordecai and Rigby are walking through the woods at night while it's raining. They spot a woman who is randomly shooting a gun in the air and try to detain her as they feel threatened. The woman shoots Mordecai in the leg, and then Rigby tries to wrestle the gun away from her. Rigby accidentally shoots and kills Mordecai, and then he gets detained by some guards as police sirens scream in the background. The episode ends with Rigby talking to his grandchildren about his best friend. I'm not really sure what else to say about this episode. 
It feels like a weird gun PSA almost. Like something that would be seen on TV in the 90s. It's not really creepy, nor is it interesting. It just sort of exists. I highly recommend not reading this one. I'm not gonna lie, I've never seen Jungle Junction and I don't think I ever will. It's a kids show that hardly anyone talks about anymore. This creepypasta has a character named Zooter, pull a Sonic.exe, and go all evil. The character's eyes turn black and have red pupils in the center, then Zooter goes on a killing spree, since a voice in his head is telling him to. The character kills all of his friends one by one in different ways. This creepypasta feels like another story that wants to be Sonic.exe. It's not very good and I wouldn't recommend it to anyone even fans of the show. When the author was younger, he had an old box TV with an antenna in his room. The only channel it would pick up were local ones. Even those channels came up more as faded screens and black and white images. There was one show that would appear crystal clear though, a show called Gurgles and Bugman. Gurgles was a clown with completely black eyes and Bugman wore a prosthetic to make him look like a fly. The two were pretty frightening and the black and white video made them even more so. The show was kind of like Candid Camera, a prank show that pranked random people. This one was a bit different though. Every episode would start with Gurgles the Clown holding a finger up to his lips and staring at the camera. Then they would find an unsuspecting victim to follow and prank. A laugh track would start in the background as Gurgles and Bugman broke into someone's house and stayed just out of sight. They would occasionally move the victim's glass of water or misplace their pen. All the while, the laugh track would get slightly louder. This would go on for a while before it started to get later and Gurgles and Bugman would then start hiding in harder to find places. They would hide in ceiling tiles, under beds, and in closets. They would stay in those places for a while and wait for their pranky to fall asleep. Once they were asleep, Bugman would slowly make his way over to the bed. He would slither up next to them very quietly. Then he would smile and a sharp straw could be seen in his mouth. He would jab the straw into the back of the neck of their victim and wait a moment as the victim would either immediately go limp or begin to twitch. While this happened, the laugh track would go from mild laughter to claps and cheers. Bugman would drink something from their neck until the victim looked limp. Gurgles would then directly face the camera and say, see you again soon. The next day the author found their TV was gone and honestly they weren't upset at all. Their parents told them that they'd sold it to make a little money to pay the bills. This didn't bother the author, who was glad they didn't have to experience the show again. Years later, the author asked about the TV again, and the parents exchanged nervous glances. Halfway through that year, a classmate of the author's had gone missing. The parents were blamed and taken into custody. The author told their teacher they'd seen the classmate on the Gurgles and Bugman show the night before, so they couldn't be missing. After hearing this, the parents threw the TV away. They explained to the author that the TV was kept in the room, but it was broken and had actually never been plugged in. I can't tell if this is supposed to be a troll pasta or not. Lostpony.txt does the cardinal sin of referencing other well-established greedy pastas in a fandom. The first paragraph mentions both Cupcakes and the Luna game, both of which were extremely popular in the brony community already. Lostpony.txt is about a person who torrents My Little Pony Season 3 and finds an extra episode. The episode in question turns out to be an official looking animation of Cupcakes. Then it turns into the Luna game, except with a different character. This is just not good writing for a Lost Episode creepypasta. It's bad enough to reference that you're a fan of creepypastas, but to literally just retell their stories without even writing anything new for yours is not a good look. The creepypasta is short but not sweet. It's just not that good. I wouldn't recommend this one unless you're really into knowing every single creepypasta in the genre. Timothy Goes to School is a popular kids show that started in 2000. It's also one of the author's favorite shows. He was a big fan of creepypastas and wondered if there was one based off of Timothy Goes to School. Sure enough, he found one on YouTube titled Timothy's Bad Week. The episode started how most Lost Episode pastas do, with it being black and white and lower quality. The episode had the characters acting strange. One was extremely angry and got angrier as the week progressed. Two characters were brutally fighting one another until one of them was gone altogether. 
The main character is looking more and more dirty as the episodes progress. Each transition had a new day listed, starting with Monday. As the week progressed, more and more would be wrong with the kids on the bus, until the final day when a bunch of them were missing and the ones that remained looked terrified. This isn't by any means a good lost episode creepypasta. It's actually pretty cliche, and the story calling out tropes and cliches doesn't make it less cliche. It's a little referential and otherwise not that scary, pretty tame by creepypasta standards. John Weldon isn't one of the better known names in animation, but those who saw his rather dark animated shorts tend to remember them. A Canadian, Weldon is best known in the United States for his shorts that aired on Cartoon Network's compilation show, Oh Canada. His best known short is A Disturbing To Be, a cartoon dealing with the ethics of cloning and individual existence. Other examples of his works are The Lump, a bizarre story about a growth deformity changing a man's life for the better, and Special Delivery, which dealt with murder, adultery, and even had full frontal nudity. Despite what he got away with, there was one short Weldon made that only a few people have ever seen or heard of, Sunlit Nightmare. The exact year was made isn't known, but indications point to the early to mid 80s. Weldon had suddenly started to show signs of narcolepsy, falling asleep suddenly at work. He would wake up screaming and refuse to say anything about what he had seen or been dreaming about. When he wasn't asleep, he worked with feverish devotion on a new animated short, the aforementioned Sunlit Nightmare. Skilled at nearly every aspect of animation, Weldon made the entire short himself, or at least he seemed to. He said his newest short was for children, something to air between shows on kids' networks. He showed it to some executives at a company who were terrified and couldn't believe Weldon wanted to show it to children. Weldon didn't seem to care and went to work on another project as his narcolepsy had disappeared. It isn't clear what had happened to the original copy of the short, but O Canada somehow got a copy and aired it once. One night in the summer of 1999, recently, someone who apparently recorded the sole airing uploaded it online, and the short was finally seen. The short began with a pure black screen, there was no title, what sounded like a small boy was singing. The shadows at night don't scare me, the sounds in the dark I can let be. I close my eyes and let the darkness come. But the fear isn't there until I feel the sun. I can tell which one is real. I can tell apart the feel of the nightmares in my head, but I don't understand how I'm not dead. After this song, the short animation transitioned into a small boy in the living room. The animation was very simple. The boy and the furniture were drawn in a squiggly style by a black pen. The background and non-outlined parts of the objects were paper white. The boy was nervously looking around the room and was very jittery. While he looked, there was a voiceover. I used to be afraid of the dark. I would stay up all night, afraid of the monsters that were hiding in the shadows. One day, I was tired from not sleeping the night before. I lay down on the couch and thought I could sleep when it was sunny out. I had the scariest dream ever. I couldn't even remember it all. All I could remember was that a beam of sun was shining on me when I woke up. Ever since then, I haven't been afraid of the dark. The boy kept looking and the view changed to behind the couch. A glob of black clay was behind it, real clay. It started to grow and turned into some kind of insect or spider. When it was taller than the couch, it jumped out from behind and started chasing the boy. They ran through several rooms of the house. The drawing quality of the rooms improved with each new one until they were in a bedroom against a live action, completely frozen backdrop. The monster cornered the boy, grew a gigantic mouth and swallowed him. The next part is hard to describe, it was all claymation. Clay insects, people, and transforming shapes were dancing, warping and morphing. It was very fast paced, but the music was very slow. Played entirely on high pitched bells. The boy eventually fell out of one of the shapes. He was curled up in fear, sobbing. The view shifted back to the room from the beginning of the short. The boy was lying on the floor, a yellow beam of sunlight shining on him. The singing started again. Every day it's the exact same thing. The monsters roar and bite and sting. No one is home, no one can help me. I wish I could leave, but outside I see the burning dry glare. The brightness is in the air. I used to fear the dark, but now I'm the only one who had to deal with an endless, hopeless fear of the sun.
Rugrats is a childhood favorite of mine, and this creepypasta doesn't really do it for me. It's very clearly supposed to be a troll pasta, but it isn't entertaining in the way a troll pasta should be. The author states that an adult version of Rugrats was being worked on called Rug Rascals, but it was never made since the pilot was too dark. The pilot is about Chucky's mom who is dying in the hospital, which could be a very important scene, but it just turns into weird gibberish. Supposedly, there's creepy imagery coming up as Chucky talks to his mom in the hospital, such as a chicken getting its head chopped off or a cow being sent to a building titled Slaughterhouse. Overall, this creepypasta is just kind of boring. It doesn't do anything new, and it's not really even a little eerie. Rugrats could have really good creepypastas, but this isn't one of them. Honestly, this is a very long troll pasta, and I'm kind of tired of looking at these, so I'm going to guess the plot for this one. I think the dad in Peppa Pig dies by the hands of her arch nemesis, Lucina from Fire Emblem. Yeah, that's real. Look it up. Then she goes to be sad before either taking her life or going on a murderous rampage. Either way, it'll involve hyper-realistic eyes and tons of blood and guts. Hopefully, it doesn't also reference every other lost episode creepypasta ever told along the way. I don't think this one's worth reading because I didn't finish reading it. Let's just get to the last one. Sometimes your memory can play tricks on you. You can remember something entirely different than what actually happened. That's what the author of Lost Episodes Can Be Found Again thought. When he was a child, he stayed up way past his bedtime. He was watching a movie that many of us had already seen. It was The Aristocats, the Disney classic but for some reason, the movie was different. A scene of the cats being drowned by an angry woman was shown. After that, there were scenes that seemed straight out of a trippy, psychedelic horror film. This left a very strong impression on the author, who believed this was how the film actually was. He spent most of his young childhood believing this, and had countless nightmares about the film. It wasn't until he was a teenager and he had brought it up with some of his friends that he learned the truth. This movie that he'd seen wasn't the actual movie. Instead, it was a disturbing corruption of the film. It was so strange as no one else had ever heard of this version of the movie. The author was starting to think it was all a bad memory, or a nightmare that somehow twisted into his memories. That was until the author had heard of an internet urban legend known as Lost Episodes. People have claimed to see altered versions of movies and TV shows that contain disturbing and graphic content. These Lost Episodes usually dealt with cartoons and animation. The author didn't think much of the urban legend, but with his experience with the Aristocats, it started to interest him. His memories could be real, and this urban legend could explain it. Somehow he'd seen a lost episode version of the Aristocats. The author began his search online with a YouTube channel that he'd found. The YouTuber had a video for his 40k sub special where he was looking into a supposed lost episode of Batman, the 1968 filmation version. The video showed an altered version of the cartoon, but it was obvious that it was just edited. The original Lost episode, Urban Legend, claimed that Batman and Robin were killed on screen and then a funeral was held afterwards. In this version, Batman and Robin were killed off screen and there was no mention of a funeral afterwards. The video wasn't much of a lead, but the comment section had several people claiming that they'd seen the altered animation. The author asked one of the commenters and got a reply pretty quickly. The reply said that he'd seen it at a library when he was younger. He had no information beyond this one lost episode. The author found other claims, but most of them seemed less than legitimate. His search took a little bit of a lull before he came upon an image. There was a thread on a Chinese message board with an image. The image was of the black cat from the Aristocats, but with red eyes and he was now very close to the screen. This screenshot sparked memories in the author that he would thought he'd buried years ago. The caption under the image said, Aristocats creepy. It wasn't much to go off, in fact, he couldn't find anything more than this image. No results came up when using reverse image search either. The image wasn't important. What was important was that it proved that it did exist and that his memories weren't deceiving him. An email to the author led him to searching for the Lost Media Group. Those searches only led him to the Lost Media Society. The society was mainly for Lost Media enthusiasts and not the kind he was looking for. Lost episodes were seen as a lowly art form in the community and not seen as real lost media. The author still made connections in the group. Eventually, he established himself as a regular and sent a message to the admin asking about the lost media group. He had hoped to find the next step in his search. A message came in and it was the lead he was looking for. 
The message from the group admin said the Lost Media Group was believed to be the group behind the entire Lost episode phenomena. The group mainly were just rumored to exist, though. The email ended with mentioning a man who used to be an admin for the website that was a supposed collector of the kinds of things the author was asking about. The author sent the collector an email and waited for a response. In the meantime, he'd heard about a lost episode of the Flintstones that he was going to go check out. The full story of the lost episodes can be found again is really good, but a very long read. I suggest to everyone watching this to look into the creepypasta. It does some really interesting things with the lost episode concept, but doesn't ruin the lore for other lost episodes. I'm going to stop here because it would make this already long video much longer. I may revisit this creepypasta for its own video down the road. It's a really good one and uses a concept I love in the creepypasta world. Overall, a great creepypasta and a standout in the sea of mediocre lost episode pastas. And that's the end of the lost episode creepypasta iceberg. It was a lot longer than I expected it to be, but I'm overall pretty happy with it. I know a lot of people were asking for it while I was working on the gaming creepypasta iceberg, so I'm glad I got to create this for the members of the community. If you have suggestions for videos and icebergs you'd like to see, you can join the Discord and leave your suggestions in the video suggestions chat. I do check that daily to see what interests the community, and actually this is one of those suggestions. If you like the video, leave a comment, subscribe to the channel. You can also follow me on social media, links to those are down in the description below. Thanks for watching everyone, and I'll see you next time.